meeting of 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee, and I wish all members of the committee and everyone else around the table a happy new year. Uh, we received apologies for today's meeting from Alexander Burnett, and we've also received apologies from Graeme Roy, who's unable to come and give evidence today. The first item on agenda is to take evidence on the Office of Budget Responsibilities Economic and Fiscal Outlook, and it's the Vol Taxes forecast, both of which were published alongside the UK Autumn Statement in November. And we're joined for this item by the Chairman of the OBR, Robert Choate. I very much welcome Robert Choate to the meeting and invite him, if he wishes, to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you very much indeed, convener. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to uh, be here. I'm conscious that I'm your first appearance at the, in the new year for the second year running, which suggests a, uh, a degree of masochism on your part, which is much to be commended. Um, uh, it, it, just as I say, by way of introduction, the, uh, since I last uh, appeared before you, uh, we've published two forecasts in March and November uh, of last year, and our next forecast is coming up uh, with the UK uh, now spring statement on March the 13th. Uh, obviously, that will be the first time that we'll have a chance to uh, take detailed account of the Scottish budget measures which you're considering uh, at the moment, so any uh, questions I, uh, I answer for you on that will necessarily be somewhat vague and provisional until we've uh, fully crunch those uh, for that forecast. Um, in terms of the process, I should just uh, reiterate that uh, we've once again had uh, very useful uh, interactions both with the Scottish Fiscal Commission and with uh, officials of uh, the Scottish Government. They've uh, both been very generous with their uh, time and expertise in providing input that's been useful in our forecast, and I hope that we've been able to help them uh, in their uh, preparations and deliberations now that the fiscal framework has moved forward to this stage of the Commission being fully responsible responsible for uh, the forecasts. Uh, we, you know, we are independent institutions and we have a shared uh, lack of anxiety about coming up with different answers to the same question, but we feel a shared responsibility to explain to you as best we can why they're different, if they are different, uh, and, to, uh, and to be as transparent about that as we can. And I think the, uh, uh, the Commission's uh, December document was a, was a model of, of, of how to do that. Uh, in terms of the uh, substance, if you go back to the forecast that we published uh, in November, the backdrop to that was that economic growth had been somewhat weaker than anticipated over the first three quarters of 2017 than we'd anticipated back in uh, March uh, of last year. Uh, the Brexit squeeze on consumer spending came one quarter earlier than we had anticipated previously, but there was no uh, substantive uh, uh, difference there. What was more notable was a feature that has been consistent in our forecasts for years now, which is weaker than expected performance in productivity and stronger than expected performance uh, in employment within a given outcome uh, for economic growth. And the most substantive revisions that we made to our forecasts in November relative to the preceding March were to take a step back and look at the record of productivity growth uh, over the period since the financial crisis, much weaker than it had been in the period running up to the financial uh, crisis, uh, or a little bit before. It's not clear that's actually the point at which the, at which the pattern uh, breaks. Uh, and we noted also that this is a phenomenon that is by no means unique to the UK. Uh, in many industrial countries, you have seen this weakness of unexpected weakness in productivity relative to preceding patterns. And if you look at the revisions to underlying productivity growth made by the Congressional Budget Office for the United States, they're very similar to the ones that we've made over the last uh, five or six years responding to the same sets of issues. So we assumed that there was a weaker period of trend productivity growth. There were some offsetting factors there. We assumed that unemployment can be sustained at a lower level than was previously uh, the case, taking some different views on the average hours worked in the economy, participation rates, etc. But the net effect was that the, poten the growth potential of the economy over the next five years we have judged to be less than we thought back in March by basically taking a view on productivity that is roughly in between the record of the last few years and the earlier uh, much uh, stronger period. Uh, weaker potential GDP growth means weaker actual GDP growth and weaker growth in all the major tax bases and therefore that has implications for the public finances. In terms of the public finances, in November, 
The recent news had actually been somewhat better than expected. The Office for National Statistics had revised down the budget deficit for 2016-17, the previous year, and things were proceeding relatively well in 2017-18. So you started off with the public finances in slightly stronger shape than we had anticipated back in March, but then with a weaker outlook for the economy, that initial unexpected good news is used up, and by the end of the forecast period, you have higher government borrowing uh, than we uh, had in the, in the March forecast. The policy measures that the UK government took in March added a bit to borrowing in the first couple of years, some extra spending, some, uh, some tax reductions, but with much less effect towards the uh, end of the uh, end of the forecast uh, period. So weaker outlook for the economy driven primarily by stepping back and looking at the historical performance of productivity and a weaker outlook in the medium term for uh, the public finances. If you look at that in the context of what the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, produced in December, they clearly have a weaker outlook for Scottish GDP growth than we do for UK GDP growth. We have UK GDP growth averaging about 1.4% a year over the next five years. The Commission have Scottish GDP growth uh, somewhat below 1%. The major drivers of that difference are... Uh, weaker assumptions about prospective population growth. That's the largest single factor. Uh, the Commission, I think, has also taken a marginally more pessimistic view about productivity, underlying productivity growth, than we have done. And then, much less important in quantitative terms, is a difference in the view of the amount of spare capacity the, there is in the economy at the moment and different assumptions about uh, net inward migration. In terms of the devolved taxes uh, picture, for income tax, I think if you look at the, the, the relevant comparison is between our November forecast and the Fiscal Commission's December forecast, excluding the impact of the announced changes to income tax rates, which obviously we wouldn't have included, we, we didn't include in the November forecast. And if you look at those, that comparison, that like-for-like -like comparison, uh, it's very, very similar. Uh, differences of less than 2% in each year of the forecast looking forward, actually slightly greater differences uh, in the interpretation of what's happened over the last uh, couple of years. The uh, as I say, we obviously haven't had a detailed uh, look yet uh, at trying to cost the, uh, the income tax measures. I note that the Commission has basically taken the taxable income elasticities, the estimates of how taxable income responds to changes in the marginal uh, income tax uh, rate, and has basically adopted, or rather has come up with something that is consistent with uh, what we've used in the UK context for changes of this sort, but assuming that there's, there's greater responsiveness at, for higher incomes. Uh, and uh, they reasonably point to the, to the greater possibility of uh, cross Scotland, rest of UK border issues there. Uh, that's obviously something we'll have to reach a judgment on. One other thing I think we'll take into consideration is whether the fact that the UK taxable income elasticities are estimated on a measure of income that includes dividends, whereas the Scottish tax base doesn't include dividends, whether that would lead us to reach any different conclusion. The other thing I think we'll need to look at is forestalling. The, the Fiscal Commission haven't uh, made a specific adjustment for that. We'll need to decide whether we want to do that. Again, uh, the fact that the tax base excludes dividends means you're excluding the, the channel through which most forestalling activity tends to take place. So I think with both of those judgments, if we take a different view, I don't think it's a dramatic difference of opinion and that it's going to be quantitatively uh, terribly uh, significant. Uh, on uh, LBTT, the differences between the forecasts are slightly larger, as you would expect for a much more volatile uh, tax series, but our methodologies are now pretty, uh, pretty close. We, we've uh, moved in the direction of the, of the approaches that the, um, uh, that the Fiscal Commission is using, and we, we both keep that uh, under, under review. Uh, and I think on uh, landfill, obviously much smaller quantitative numbers at stake. The percentage differences in the forecast slightly greater. I think that's probably because the Commission has had more recent information on uh, the infrastructure for uh, incineration than we have, and so we'll be looking at that when we get to uh, the March forecast as well. So I hope that covers most of the territory relatively briefly, and happy to take <laughs> yeah, it else. Well, it was a very helpful introduction, and, and 
setting the ground. It was very, very helpful indeed. But you picked up an issue, the spare capacity in the economy yourself, Robert, in terms of your opening statement. And that was one of the issues, actually, the Scottish Fiscal Commission <coughs> raised with us in their report, um, which, was, which we discussed with them before Christmas, in that they were actually suggesting that in, in Scotland we were over capacity. Uh, and in your own report, uh, the largest change you've made to your economic forecast is revised down the trend or potential productivity growth by an average of about 0.7% a year. You also state that the economy is operating, operating near potential and the output gap is small. Um, can you explain a bit more detail what you mean by that? Um, why you've decided to revise down the growth because of that? And actually, the question I beg, seems to beg to me is, in these circumstances, with the information from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, and although well, not the same, but same trajectory from yourself, where are we going to get the growth from? Hmm. Uh, well, conceptually, the way you, we think about the, the path of actual GDP growth over the next five years combines a view of what's going to happen to potential GDP growth. And potential GDP growth is basically, uh, or, or the potential output of the economy, is the level of output of goods and services that is sustainable in the sense that you wouldn't expect it to be putting uh, consistent upward or, or downward pressure on inflation. So in the UK context, if you assume that the Bank of England is pursuing an inflation target, implicitly is the idea that once they've got inflation to the level they're happy with, they want to keep actual output in line with potential output, so you're not shoving inflation up or down uh, from that sort of, uh, of level. So an, an anchoring assumption for our forecast is that towards the end, unless you're starting from a position with a very big or small uh, output gap, that you end up with uh, actual output equal to uh, potential output. So in that case, the actual amount of GDP growth you get over the next five years reflects that growth in potential plus anything you add or subtract from how far away you are from potential to begin with. And as you say, the, uh, our judgment at the moment is that the economy is fractionally below uh, potential, less than half a percentage point uh, below, and the Commission's view is that in Scotland it's about half a percent high. I would not uh, above potential. I would not, you know, argue that those differences are significant in the context of the uncertainty that lies around any estimate of that number uh, to begin with. Potential output in the economy is not something that you can directly measure by counting up the number of widgets that are produced. It's a sort of, it's a, it's a concept of how many widgets you could produce consistent with inflation uh, being uh, stable. At the margin, if you start above potential, as the Commission suggests, then actual GDP growth is going to be slightly weaker than potential GDP growth over the five years, and for us it will be slightly stronger, but much the more important determinant of how quickly the economy grows and how quickly tax receipts go is that growth in potential, not the starting point because the difference isn't that great. Why have we revised down the growth in potential? It is primarily because of the judgment we've made on potential uh, GDP growth, which we have pulled down significantly uh, between uh, the March and November forecasts. One point to clear up, that is not a judgment about we have taken a fresh, detailed look at the potential implications of Brexit. We did make an adjustment to potential GDP growth in an earlier forecast for that, but we've, we've not revisited it. It's more a question of looking at this uh, puzzle of why it is that productivity growth has been so much weaker over the past decade than it was over the three or four preceding decades. Roughly 0.2, 0.3% a year since the financial crisis compared to 2% a year or a little above uh, beforehand. If you go back a few years to the forecast that we were producing in 2011, 12, 13, we would have been pointing to a number of potential explanations linked closely to the financial crisis. Uh, for example, uh, the hoarding of labour as firms assumed that things were going to get better just around the corner, or uh, the problems in the financial system pre preventing capital being reallocated away from inefficient firms towards efficient ones. But as this period of weakness has gone on, and as it has been mirrored in other countries as well as in the UK, Resting too much weight on those temporary explanations that say it's going to be difficult for a couple of years, but then we're going to snap back to the historical average fairly quickly doesn't look as, as plausible. 
Uh, so the judgment that we've had to make is to basically decide what weight to place on the weak performance of the pre last 10 years versus the stronger performance of the preceding 30 to 40 years in taking a view on the, on the, uh, the medium-term outlook. And, you know, there's not a huge amount of science in this. We've roughly split the difference uh, between the two because we don't have, nobody has firm explanations for why this dramatic slowdown has happened. The Fiscal Commission, as I understand it, or as I can read from their numbers, have similarly looked at roughly what would be halfway between recent performance and the earlier performance, and they may have shaped it to the slightly more pessimistic side of that balance than we have, but I wouldn't overstate uh, the significance of that difference. For, for both of us and for anybody doing a medium-term forecast for the Scotland, for the UK economy, for any other large industrial country, this puzzle of, you know, what weight do you place on this remarkable difference that we've seen between the last 10 years and the previous 40 just stands out as the single most important and unfathomable challenge facing economic forecasters. Right, well, there we go then. Thank you very much. Um, James. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Bruce, and uh, good morning, Robert. Um, just interested picking up on this uh, issue of kind of weak growth and the way you've, you've essentially kind of taking another look at the, the forecasts um, in terms of sort of moving forward. In relation to output, uh, one of the drivers towards that is, is average hours and the view that you'd taken previously, um, and obviously there's evidence to back this up, s since the financial crisis is that uh, the number of hours worked, uh, has, uh, average hours worked has increased and the implication seems to be that that's because uh, the, the wages that people are earning have not been matched uh, by inflation, so they've had to either take on other jobs or work extra hours in order to make up that shortfall. And what you're now saying is that you, you thought initially that that trend would eventually start to correct itself, but that's not happening. So uh, I'm just interested in the assumptions on that going forward in terms of, you know, that... that Average average hours uh, what uh, continuing to be at that kind of higher level, and uh, is that kind of implication of you know people having to continue to work increased hours because the 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 their the kind of core wages, if you like, um, are not keeping pace with inflation? Is that a trend that's going to continue? Uh, you've explained that uh, very well indeed. It's the uh this is one of the long, you know, a very long-standing trend is for average hours to decline over time. And we're talking here, you know, decades to centuries of, of evidence of, of this. And as you say, that ceased to be the case over the time of the financial crisis, and you saw average hours uh, going up. Uh, and, you know, again, as rather with productivity, when you're confronted with an abrupt change to a relatively long-standing historical pattern of that sort, you have to decide whether you know, this is just a temporary aberration and you're going to get back to the, to the long-standing downward trend or whether something more substantive and permanent uh, has changed. And the view that we had taken in most previous forecasts prior to the last one was that it, it, was, a fa you know, it was pretty temporary uh, and that you were going to see a, a return to the, uh, to the downward trend. And that's very much linked up to this idea of, that I, I mentioned a moment ago about you know, for what it's worth, assuming that some of the explanations for weak productivity growth were temporary ones, perhaps related to the financial crisis, and therefore you get back to something more normal relatively quickly. The fact that that hasn't happened, and the fact that we have simultaneously made this judgment that now productivity growth is going to be weaker looking forward, and therefore earnings growth is also going to be weaker looking forward, uh, it seems logically to go alongside the judgment that we've made on productivity growth and on earnings growth that you don't assume that you snap back to the long-run decline as quickly as we had previously been uh, assuming. Uh, again, in deciding what to do alternatively, you don't overstate the sciences involved in this. We've essentially assumed that it looks flat uh, going forward, but there is clearly significant uncertainty uh, on both sides. And as I say, one of the uncertainties is just knowing whether this is people responding to uh, a, uh, the unexpected weakness of, pro of, of earnings growth and therefore wanting to protect their incomes from that by, as you say, working longer hours or having a second job uh, uh, or something like that, 
or whether in a world in which people get used to weaker earnings growth, they'll just adjust their their expectations of living standards and maybe want to go back to that downward trend. So uh, there are considerable uncertainties in both directions, but the, the, the broad judgment that we've made is that you don't see this snap back to the downward trend as quickly as you otherwise would do, and we assume for the sake of argument and for the sake of the forecast that it, it's flat uh, from here on out. So that is a slight offset in terms of potential GDP growth to the productivity adjustment, because if people are working more hours than they otherwise would have done, there's more income, more, uh, more economic activity going on. But it's only a small partial offset to the larger, more significant adjustment on, on potential productivity growth. OK, um, that's, that's helpful. Just again, uh, linked to that, uh, certainly over the last year, there's been an increased you know, political profile around trying to address the issues around public sector pay and you know, giving fair increases to public sector workers. Obviously, we'll need to await the, the round of wage settlements that are going to come up, but I think it's fair to say that there's a, a greater political impetus behind it. Is that something you've taken into account in terms of uh, looking to these future forecasts? Uh, well, on the on the pay side, I mean, at the at the whole economy level, uh, we uh, uh, which is the way in which we tend to look at the pay. Thing, the fact that you have weaker productivity growth is implying weaker earnings growth, both in in uh, in cash terms and weaker growth in real earnings than would, you would otherwise anticipate. In terms of the public sector. Uh, uh, we obviously haven't had take, uh, have not taken into account the announcements from the Scottish Government on, on public sector pay, and I, I'm not sure the Commission have either, because of, it came up relatively late in the draft uh, budget process. They, I think, produce uh, an earnings forecast and an income tax forecast on a more bottom-up basis than we do looking at public and private sector and bringing those things together, which are, you know, I think reflects the, the greater importance of public sector pay in the Scottish uh, context. For, for the UK forecast, we were addressing, we had to address two issues. One is that the government had basically, uh, uh, the, the Westminster government is placing less of a constraint on public sector pay. They basically know, you know, simplifying it somewhat, they're no longer constraining it to 1% a year, but there's no alternative, this is what it should be, a policy. And simultaneously, you've had government departments being, over the next couple of years in particular, giving some more money uh, to spend. So the judgments that we have to make sort of combine those uh, two. We would assume that if the government no longer instructs public sector employers to keep pay to, to 1%. There's obviously, you would expect that to be higher, and we assume that public sector pay will return to the whole economy average or to in line with, with uh, private sector pay more quickly than we would have done previously because that constraint has been lifted. How do public sector employers respond to that? Well, partly they may respond to it by changing the balance of the way they allocate their budgets between pay and non-pay. So if you're, gonna, if you're wanting to or under uh, pressure to spend more on pay, you might try to uh, spend less on procurement and put some more money in on that basis. But the other way, obviously, you do it, uh, even if you've managed to put some more money into the pot from that source, is by having higher pay growth in the public sector but fewer jobs. And... Uh, if you provide, in addition to that judgment, more money for departments to spend, then they're going to spend some of that on pay and some of that on non-pay. Our overall judgment is that you will still see less growth in public, or rather a smaller uh, public sector employment than you otherwise would have done because of this uh, relaxation of, of pressure on pay, but some of the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the pressure is soaked up, first of all, by a reallocation from non-pay to pay, and secondly, by the fact the government has provided some more money for departmental spending, in particular, over the next couple of years. OK, thank you. Thank you. Wally, I think you had some questions in this area as well. Yes, thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, good morning again, Robert. I was, I was going to ask you what, what's actually been happening in your view to reduce this sort of productivity thing uh, over the last 10 years, and you've kind of explained that you've, you've offered some suggestions comparing to the previous 40, but what, what can governments or industry or anybody do to, to, to provide some kind of stimulus to change this? It's, it's as though they've, we've got into a, a frame of mind where we don't want to change, or industry doesn't want to change, given the financial crisis, and we're not going to move 
until something else happens. What, what could reasonably be done to, to provide a stimulus to change this, to get this turning around the way we want? Uh, well, it's a, the, the fact that this is a global phenomenon indicates how difficult this is. You know, it's not a... Uh, it's something where you appoint to a particular deficiency in national policy in one or two countries that can be addressed to bring them into line with the better performance elsewhere. There's a, I mean, with the UK, productivity performance is weaker than most since the crisis, but there is this, uh, this global element to it. There are... Um, I mean, the, in terms of what would you do to boost productivity, I mean, numerous reports have been produced on this, which tend to say spend more on training, spend more on education, spend more on infrastructure, uh, um, planning reform, etc. So the, the list of long-term structural reforms doesn't tend to get any you know, different. Obviously, those things can always be revisited, and uh, have you ever pursued any of them as much as some people would say uh, would be necessary? The thing with all of those policies is that, you know, turnaround implies a rapid response. Uh, those sorts of productivity-enhancing policies are of their nature slow-burn ones, and the great challenge then, of course, is knowing what effect they've had, because if we see productivity growth improving or declining over the next five to ten years, to what extent is that the response to a particular set of policy developments, or is it that the underlying policy of the underlying productivity puzzle has resolved itself one way or another? Uh, I mean, one reason, there are those who would say that we're still too, opt we're too optimistic and that you should just assume that the last decade is the new normal. Uh, the sort of most extreme techno-pessimist view of this is, uh, has been put forward by an economist in the United States called Bob Gordon, who, simplifying it somewhat, his argument is basically we've had three industrial revolutions and that's your lot, uh, and therefore you're not going to see that sort, of, that sort of pick up again. And I don't think you know, we have the evidence to be in that camp. We are assuming that you see productivity growth beginning to pick up, and there's a couple of reasons why I think that still looks reasonable to expect. One of which is that the labour market is tightening, coming back to the point that we started with. You know, there's not a great deal of, of spare capacity and there's a lot of uncertainty about the amount of spare capacity, but it's hard. You know, unemployment has dropped a long way. You know, it's not realistic to expect... You, you can't go on and on and on uh, dropping. So as uh, constraints in the labour market intensify, as firms find it harder to provide uh, or to find uh, uh, additional skilled labour, that will provide an impetus for them to rearrange their processes in a more productive, more efficient way, uh, you hope. Similarly, albeit very slowly, we assume that monetary policy is going to start tightening. So one of the potential explanations for why productivity growth has been so weak is that interest rates have been so low, so firms have not been under pressure to improve their their productivity because their, the servicing of their debt has been relatively uh, straightforward. You know, we are Expect, we have started to see interest rates going up, and if they go up further, that too could provide some stimulus. So now, those are the sort of main explanations for why we've not chucked all our eggs into the last 10 years' gloomy basket. Uh, but in terms of the policy response, as I say, the list of things that were the reports on how to improve productivity growth doesn't really change very much over time. It's things like education, infrastructure, planning, etc., those are all easier to stick in a report than they are to implement wherever you're trying to do it. Mm. But I mean, we know we're in a, an extended and a long period of austerity, and every year perhaps most of us look around and, and hope, or, and maybe more hope than expectation, that this will change and spend, the spending cut trend will reverse. But is, it, is it, are you really seriously saying that the, the austerity period is the, is the new norm and this is just to continue forevermore into the beyond the horizon that we can see? Is, that, is this what people can expect in the public sector and elsewhere, that austerity will just continue to roll on the way it has been? Um, well, in, the, in terms of cutting public expenditure as a share of, of GDP, uh, if you look at the, the, the quantified fiscal targets that the government has set itself for the size of the structural deficit, i.e. the deficit that will be left if the economy gets to a Goldilocks state that's neither too hot, neither too cold. They're on course to achieve that, for, uh, that target in 2021 with a little bit of room for manoeuvre. So 
that on itself does not imply the, uh, an automatic need for greater austerity than is or greater fiscal consolidation than is already planned. However, the government has also, the Westminster government has also uh, stated a longer term, broader goal of essentially getting the budget back into uh, balance. Now, e our f uh, e and, the, and the, the, the date they've put on that is broadly the sort of 2025-ish uh, uh, period. Now, our, for our formal forecasts don't go that far into the future, but it doesn't look on the basis of, of the forecasts that we have going to a couple of years before that, that they are n yet on course to achieve that. The deficit is still above zero and not on a clear downward trajectory uh, right at the end of the forecast period. And as you go into the mid-2020s, this is the period at which the ageing population, if anything, will be putting upward pressure on public expenditure rather than downward pressure on public expenditure. So uh, the conclusion some people would draw is that if you know, this or future governments are serious about balancing the budget, there's more fiscal consolidation to come on top of what's in the pipeline already. There are others who say history suggests that actually you end up being content or at least living with a relatively small period of borrowing that actually budget surpluses and balances are uh, are relatively rare. So, uh, you know, uh, what you expect to come out of that depends on how, uh, in part, on how committed you think the government actually would be to getting down to a completely balanced uh, budget. So it's going to go well at least to 2025, though, in this... Well, if you go, if you if you look at the period, clearly in the in the in the numbers that we have already, you're seeing, you know, you're relying on some continued squeeze on public expenditure as a share of GDP to deliver the further improvements in in the the budget deficit that's in the it's in the book already. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. Before I get to Murdo and the difference between Scotland, England, and growth, Patrick, do you have a supplementary in this area? Yeah, thank you, convener. Good morning. I just wanted to explore with you uh, what the implications are of this. Uh, uncertainty you've described about um, uh, what's happening with productivity, whether the last 10 years is the new normal or there's, there's going to be a return, the idea that people are just splitting the difference to, to cast their, their projections forward. Um, is this period of uncertainty uh, about that, that, that puzzle resulting in any wider debate about what we measure when we talk about productivity. For the most part, we talk about it in relation to uh, labour. Uh, that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about uh, whether the people undertaking that labour actually get the economic benefit of that economic activity. Uh, we could be measuring productivity in relation, for example, to sustainable resource use or other environmental thresholds uh, that most of the world has a, a broad consensus on wanting to achieve now. So is, is this period of uncertainty about what's happening with productivity leading to a wider debate about what it is and what we're measuring it for? Yeah, I, th I think, as you've described, that, that debate has been around there for a while anyway. There, there are... There are, since there are two issues, there's, there's one r more narrow issue about are there, are there particular measurement problems, leaving aside your issue of whether GDP is the right thing to look at for a whole variety of, of reasons, and, the, and obviously the answer to that is it depends on the question you're asking whether GDP is the answer to it. But even if you're asking a question to which GDP is the answer, uh, one debate is, look, in particular in a world of, uh, you know, we're moving away from the production of physical goods to, uh, you know, digital economy, etc. Is it that we are simply mismeasuring uh, the output of the economy and actually productivity is doing better than expected because we're not measuring output, you know, we're not fully measuring uh, output. So that, that's one aspect. A related flip side of that is, were we over-measuring productivity in the period prior to the financial crisis, in particular, for example, in the financial sector. So actually, maybe the difference is not as great as it looked because of the, the way in which the statisticians try to capture value added in the, in the financial sector. So both of those are issues around which there has been a reasonable amount of debate. The Bank of England has done uh, analysis, and my, my colleague on the, uh, uh, at the OBR, Charlie Bean, has looked at this uh, as well. The general consensus is that the mismeasurement is may be part of this story, but it's hard to imagine that it explains a large part of what is now a 20% plus shortfall in productivity, uh, the level of productivity relative to what you would have anticipated. 
Now, there are then... Sorry. When the Scottish Government talks about growth, it uses the term inclusive or sustainable growth um, rather than just plain vanilla GDP growth. Uh, we could debate how successful that, that attempt has been, but the attempt is there. Would there be value in the Scottish Government trying to take a, a different approach or... Uh, you know, cut through this problem in it from a different angle and try and understand it differently by by having a, a, a measure of productivity that relates to other factors. Um, as I say, I think that the measure you use depends in part on the question you want to answer. And as you say, typically people will, you know, in addition to the narrow uh, issue of, uh, of forecasting the you know the outputs of the market economy, etc., uh, then you know well-being more broadly, bringing into account, as you say, environmental issues, distributional issues as well, uh, is important. I'm. Um, this is not an area that the OBR uh, goes into. Uh, it's not really part of our remit. When I was at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, uh, we looked. I looked at it a bit more. I'm slightly wary of trying to say, well, actually, there's a perfect single index number which allows you to capture all of those things. So we just, you know, GDP is not a very good index number, but I've got a much better one which captures all of those things. I think the nature of the sorts of uh, of broader policy questions you're describing requires you to look at a number of different indicators rather than pretending you can boil them all down into one alternative one would be my, my guess, which is, as I say, not to say that all of those policy questions aren't valuable, but trying to have a single magic number against which you can say, well, you know, overall well-being is up 0.3% yeah. yeah. this year, taking into account all of those factors. I'm not sure how helpful that is. Okay. Thank you. Mordo. Thank you. Um, good morning, uh, Mr. Choat. Um, you were talking earlier about the uh, forecast for GDP growth, both for Scotland and for the, the UK as a whole. You've obviously downgraded your forecast for the, the, the UK. The Fiscal Commission have also downgraded their forecast for Scottish growth, which is now um, forecast to be substantially lower uh, than UK growth. That's a continuation of a trend we've seen for about the last three years. Uh, where Scottish uh, GDP growth has lagged behind uh, that of the UK. Also, in terms of productivity, you've, you've downgraded productivity uh, forecast, but in Scotland we see, um, again, productivity forecast to be growing uh, below uh, the rest of the UK rates. One of the interesting um, aspects of this is that the Fiscal Commission can conclude, notwithstanding all this, that um, income tax revenues per capita are expected to grow in Scotland at the same rate as the rest of the UK. And I was wondering whether you agreed with the Fiscal Commission's conclusion there or if you had any comment to make around how they arrived at that conclusion. Um, well, I guess one issue that you might, that we wouldn't have had chance to take into account, and I don't know how much weight they would place on, is whether the implications of the latest set of proposed income tax changes by making the system more progressive uh, in the sense of having higher rates at the uh, uh, at the uh, at the top end, would lead you to expect greater uh, fiscal drag over time. So as you return, hopefully, to a situation in which earnings growth uh, proceeds ahead of inflation, that you end up pulling more income into higher tax bands and with higher those higher tax bands, uh, more uh, uh, more revenue comes out as a uh, as a result. I mean, as you say, it, it's striking that the uh, the our our November uh, our November forecast and the Fiscal Commission's December pre measures forecast are really quite close. There's a difference of one and a bit percent uh, at the end of the of our both of our forecasts, which compares to a difference of about eight percent if you were to compare our March forecast with the preceding forecast of the Scottish Government. Now even 8%. I mean, reasonable people can differ over that, and I wouldn't want to overstate the importance of that. But you are, as you point out, at a rather closer uh, level uh, there. Uh, now, obviously, we in part are taking you know, different uh, approaches to how you uh, model these things. I think one thing which is um, complicates the matters is knowing what, the, what Scottish receipts have been over the last two or three years. Uh, where actually the percentage differences for what the Scottish Fiscal Commission we assume are larger than in any of the forecast years. So um, we are at the moment in the absence of having 
uh, outturn data based on HMRC flagging Scottish taxpayers as Scottish taxpayers. We're relying on the survey of personal incomes uh, to do this. So if you go back to the last set of survey of personal income data that we're both using as a baseline in 2014-15, uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission is essentially taking the estimate of the Scottish uh, share or the Scottish uh, receipts then and is you looking at their model of what developments in the Scottish economy will be implying for the path of, uh, uh, of receipts since then and, and drawing the line accordingly in order to forecast where we are today, let alone to forecast where we're going to be in five years' time. Uh, we take a slightly different approach and because we have been slightly surprised by the fact that uh, income tax receipts turned out to be stronger in 2016-17 than the, or the original data suggested, presumably because financial sector bonuses came in more strongly, it would be, would be part of the story, uh, and that that provides a, a stronger starting point. Uh, we are more optimistic about how much Scottish income tax receipts have been over the last couple of years in the Commission. By you know, we're talking here of differences of three percent compared to one and a bit percent later on. But that slightly com complicates the picture of what you're looking at uh, going forward. But I think uh, what I don't know yet is, as I say, what difference we will assume that the newly announced measures here will have uh, on the uh, on the growth of, of receipts in, in Scotland. And you, you, I know you have had a, a lengthy discussion with them about the, the difficulties of assessing the behavioural uh, impact and therefore how much of the static increase in revenue you'd, you would have expected from the measures you're currently considering is lost as a result of behavioural responses. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, looking at the, the, the relative... Um, projected a historic growth of the Scottish economy compared to the UK economy. What do you think, what do you think are the major factors why the Scottish economy is now lagging behind the UK as a whole? Well, on the basis of the, of the Commission's projections, population growth is the largest difference. I, there is a bigger difference in the projected growth of overall GDP than there is in GDP per capita. So... Uh, I mean, the Scottish population, weaker Sc uh, population growth in Scotland relative to the rest of the UK reflects differences in uh, both the uh, natural growth in the population, so uh, uh, fertility rates. Uh, is that, sorry, is that, is that a historic problem? Does that explain what's happened over the last three years, for example? Well, I, I think that's been a much longer standing issue. The population growth has been weaker in Scotland than it has been, in the, you'll be the experts on, weaker in Scotland than it has been in the rest of the UK because of, you know, uh, uh, smaller mature family sizes at the end, uh, weaker migration period. So that's accounting for a, for a chunk of it. Uh, then, on the, then on the productivity side... Uh, as I say, I think that the Scottish uh, Fiscal Commission is taking a, is taking a weaker growth view, a somewhat weaker growth view of, of uh, trend productivity growth over the next few years, which I presume is based on their... The, they've, they've had to do the same exercise for the Scottish data as we have had to do for the UK data, which is essentially to try to judge how much weight to place on each of these two very different periods uh, of performance. But certainly I think it's right to say if you were to look in 2016 on its own, productivity growth was weaker in Scotland than, than it is in the UK. But I think we're in, in making the adjustments that we've made relative to our March forecast and that the Commission have made relative to the Scottish Government forecast that they inherited, effectively speaking, it's been much more a question of taking a step back, looking at this historical picture and saying, are we really in the right place here, than it is placing too much weight on what's happened over the last few quarters. There have been occasions when we've been thinking about making these sorts of adjustments, and the most recent data has shown things picking up quite nicely. Those dawns of the last to date turned out to be false ones, uh, and the improvement falls back. And, and uh, you know, maybe now that we've made the adjustment, this will be the point at which everything goes off to the races. And let's hope that that's the uh, the case uh, here as in the rest of the UK. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, thanks, convener, and good morning, Robert. Um, I want to touch on the um, the population issue, but I want to come back and ask a couple of questions on the productivity puzzle as well. Um, beyond that, on the back of um, earlier contributions. Um, 
On the, the population issue specifically, and, and we've just talked about the differential population growth, and it I was interested in the word historical in that context, because, of course, the differential population growth between Scotland and the UK has been a problem for 300 years, not just three years. Um, back at uh, 300 years ago, Scotland's population was more than 20% of the UK's, and now we're at about 8%. So this isn't a short-term uh, short issue. But looking in initially at what you've said uh, around about the... Um, uh, your projections for UK growth going forward. You're talking about a number of 180,000 net inward immigration into the UK that, you've, uh, that your previous forecast was based on. Your latest one is based on 165,000 um, net uh, inward immigration. Clearly, that's got an impact on growth. I think the question I'd like to ask is, is looking back to the, the pre-Brexit forecasts um, and the reality of a net inward population growth of about 300,000 plus, what is the difference um, in terms of the population growth between where we where we were pre-Brexit and where your forecast at the 165,000 number? Um, well, in terms of where we... Uh, we don't do population projections ourselves. We effectively, like the Commission, choose from the variety of variant population projections that are produced by the uh, Office for National uh, Statistics. Uh, we... At the time of the, when we made the first set of forecast adjustments after the uh, the uh, after the uh, referendum vote, we were using the principal population projection produced by the ONS. Now, the ONS, the ONS projections are not a sort of detailed assessment of the impact of particular policy settings. Uh, it's a more mechanical exercise that basically says in the near term that you assume that net inward migration is going to be like it has been in the relatively recent past, but go five years ahead, it'll more, be more like a longer term average. So there has been a tendency always for these projections to show a relatively high rate to start with, declining uh, uh, into the future. But as you said, we had been seeing uh, populate, uh, net inward migration numbers considerably higher than, than we had been assuming. In the absence of the Brexit vote, we would have moved from the principal projection to a higher one, another mechanistic one produced by the ONS. So the judgment that we in effect took then was that rather than raise our inward migration, we'd leave it where it was, but at the time, this was the November 16 forecast, uh, I don't have it here, we set out what difference that made to the growth and the public finances by, by as it were, not making that change. Uh, the fact that it's dropped from our, uh, in the most recent forecast is because we now, the ONS has updated the principal population projection. And uh, uh, the, 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 the latest numbers have moved it in that direction. I think it's fair to say that at the moment it looks as though actual developments in, in population are, appear to be moving more in line with the ONS's principal population projections than they had been doing previously. Now, you know, when we made the adjustment at the time of Brexit, it was partly on the view that you know, we weren't going to try to predict the precise outcome of where the Brexit negotiations were going to end up, but it seemed more likely that the, the migration regime would be more restrictive rather than less restrictive, so that was one reason to assume less network in migration. But also, and this I think is, is, is what's happening at the moment, is that the pull factors, i.e. in the absence of any policy change, that there is a natural tendency for fewer people to be coming into the UK in the wake of the, of the Brexit vote than was otherwise the case. And that can partly be down to the fall in the exchange rate and the value of somebody coming here, working here, and then sending money home, uh, for example. So uh, uh, the, the, the immediate Brexit adjustment was to not move to a higher population projection but to stick with the principal population projection, the change in the most recent forecast is that the ONS has revised the principal population projection down. The Commission is using uh, an alternative one, assuming less EU migration as well, which is an interesting one. I think we'll, you know, we'll, uh, 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 that's one of the ones that you can you can look at. My sense is that quantitatively, that does not make an enormous difference. So if you think about what has affected the Commission's GDP growth forecasts over the next five years relative to the Scottish Government ones they inherited, 
population and productivity are more important, and then migration and the different view on the amount of spare capacity that you're starting with are, you know, material but much smaller than the first two. But uh, just in terms of the pure numbers, then the, the, the change you've made going from 185,000 net immigrant migration to 165,000 net immigrant migration has, has got an impact on your your um, GDP growth number of of what the point? Um, well, the judgment we would have made on product. It's point two or point three, is it? Yes, I think that sounds. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like the right number. Isn't it? So I, mean, I think it's all of that order. So yes, point so uh, yes, point two percent by two thousand and twenty one twenty two. And this is this having looked at the paragraph. The another important reminder is not just the number, but that the age composition yeah, of, course, of yeah. the population looks less favourable to growth of, of net inward migration looks less favourable to growth than the previous version did. So it's not just the number that's lower, but the, the proportion of those who are of working age that is lower okay, as well. Okay, and then the, the, the forecast that the SFC is, is, is used, as you said, is to use a, a more conservative interpretation of the, of the ONS's numbers, and that is one of the principal reasons why their growth forecast for the Scottish economy is lower going forward. I think describing it as one of the principal reasons would overstate its in, in importance. Now, I, d I don't have that, you know, the equivalent of the 0.2 number for them, but I think this would be, by some way, the third or fourth largest factor after the productivity and uh, to population. Um, come on. So, so you so population, population as a whole is clearly an important factor, specifically the difference between our net inward migration and their net inward migration would be a small part of... Yeah, but the, the, the key point is the difference between where we were and where we will be, where we were pre-Brexit and where we will be going forward. Yeah, well, whether they... Yes, how much they their choice of, of regime is down to a specific view on where you end up with... Bre where you end up with in terms of migration regime, etc., I don't know. From our point of view, we've been very clear across the forecast as a whole that we're not trying we're not basing this on a particular well-defined prediction of where all these negotiations are going to end up in mm -hmm. terms of trade access and migration mm -hmm. regime it's some broad yeah, you brush, picked a number yeah. it's a broad brush adjustment but the direction is clear yeah okay okay um going to talk about productivity and, and i'm not an economist so you can kind of just help me through this but based on the contributions we've had before my understanding productivity just leaving aside Patrick Harvey's valid points about whether it's the right thing to measure and whether GDP is the right thing to measure. But um, productivity is basically a, a mathematical terms of calculation of GDP per hour worked. Um, now, you're basing your assessment of where GDP potentially could be based on the fact that productivity growth is low, therefore the potential in the economy for GDP growth is constrained to some extent. If you dig into the, the maths of that, GDP is the consumption, it's investment, it's government spending, it's the difference between import and export. When you look at those factors, you're saying, well, um, we, the point I'm making is we tend to think of productivity as people working harder, but in reality, when you dig into the maths of it, it's all about the GDP number, which is about how much people are spending, how much the government's spending, and how much has been invested. So to some extent, is there an issue whereby the fact that we've been in an environment where real wage growth is low, therefore people aren't spending as much, therefore the consum consumption number is down, the government hasn't been spending as much because of austerity, therefore the government spending number is down, those are a drag on GDP. So to some extent it's not the fact that GDP is constrained by the productivity growth it's the other way around is there some something in that uh, yeah I mean it's you would certainly uh, you can have the, the the direction of causality can can go in both uh, directions I mean you're right you can think about the underlying potential of the economy i.e the level of activity that you would get to if you assume the Bank of England is is you know getting demand in the economy to the point that is consistent with keeping inflation stable, so to getting to the Goldilocks point, as it were. Uh, and, of course, in terms of demand, you're talking about exactly the things you described there. It's the, it's the mixture of different types of spending, consumer spending, business investment, net exports, uh, et cetera, stock milling, et cetera. Um, I think what you have to bear in mind, that in terms of the... Uh, 
we, I would be wary of the argument that the, that the really the dominant direction is from sort of weak demand has been the cons has driven the weak productivity growth. The, 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 the one way of, of restating the productivity puzzle is why is it that firms have felt the need to hire so many more people to produce not very much more stuff? And that if demand was greater, would that have made that, uh, i.e. the amount of spending power in the economy was greater, would that puzzle have, have gone away? As I say, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the fact is that for the given amount of economic activity that there has been, you've just had an awful lot more of it showing up in uh, falling, un uh, falling unemployment, rising employment, and less of it in output per, either output per worker or output uh, per uh, our worked. Uh, now, clearly, there, there's an interesting debate in terms of its broader social consequences of, you know, which is better? Would you rather have a productivity puzzle or would you rather have a much larger rise in unemployment for a given uh, increase in economic activity? And certainly some people would say, well, if you go back to the sort of more 1980s model, which is where you have a uh, more of the pain of a weak economic activity being focused on a relatively small number of people who are either unemployed or on the margins of being so and fearful of being unemployed, or what we've had instead, which is actually not having a huge rise in unemployment, but having weak wage growth in both the public and the private sectors. And, you know, there's an interest, as I say, there's a, a value interesting, it's not, not one for us, as to which of those is, is, is better. But in terms of the long-term implications for living standards, you do worry about the productivity growth, and it seems sensible to have that as your constraint overall. Um, as I say, the, you know, the puzzle is, why is it that, you know, if, if you think the demand has been weak and the economic activity is weak, why have we employed so many more people? Thank you. Thank you. Adam. Thank you, Camina. Good morning. I want to ask you a completely, or I think it's a completely unrelated question, and moving into a different area of the Scottish Government's proposed budget. One of the most eye-catching features of its proposed budget is the restructuring of income tax. And I wanted to ask you about the structure of income tax in the UK and, and, in, and in Scotland. So in, in the UK, we've had three bands of income tax for quite a long time, and those bands have been set at thresholds which are quite far apart from one another. Um, and the rates are very, very, very significantly different. You move straight from 20, 20p to, four, to 40p. And the Scottish Government's proposal is that we'll replace those three bands of income tax with five bands of income tax, three of which will be very close together, 19, 20 and 21p. Um, is that likely to have any, just, I mean, just the restructure, never mind, you know, the, the, you know, you know where, where we set each... Um, each rate, just the restructuring of income tax, is that likely to have any consequence, positive or negative, on the on the Scottish economy? Is there is there a reason in terms of economic management why for 30 or 40 years now we've had a much smaller number of um, income tax bands spread quite quite far apart? Is 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 there is there such a thing in um, the thinking of professional economists about a kind of optimum? number or distribution of bands? Are there any issues here that we need to be worried about just in terms of the structure and the proposed restructuring of income tax? Um, as you say, the, sort of the mainstream economic view, when you've, you've, you've got those rates are very similar, uh, one percentage point apart in the bottom uh, three, uh, you know, um, 19, 20, uh, 21. So you wouldn't, you know, as you say, the differences between the rates at that level are not large enough, you would think, to have an enormous amount of, of implication for, uh, for the, the shape and structure of economic activity. There is clearly an issue, which I presume the, the Scottish Government has, has uh, thought about. The, the desire to have more bands at the bottom is presumably a reflection of the desire they have particular distributional objectives and maybe particular work incentive objectives that they, they think are helped by that. They may also have the view that they are well, you know, which uh, they're close together now, but maybe you want the flexibility to have them further apart in the future, uh, and that's you know laying the groundwork for that. I don't know whether that's an issue that's that's arisen at all. Clearly, the creation of new bands is something that is likely to impose some sort of administrative cost, both in terms of HMRC and of the businesses who have to adapt their payroll in order to do this, and I suspect that creating a new band involves a greater administrative cost than simply changing the rate in one that already exists. 
but I have no idea what the quantitative significance of that in terms of costs is. I don't know whether any regulatory impact assessment or equivalent has been done for the implications of that. But clearly, you are—you know—it it, it, it will require some work for firms with workers in those in in that band of of, of salaries uh, and wages uh, to to uh, adapt their payroll in order to be able to cope with that but whether that is a is a you know significant burden or not is not something I, i'm expert on but uh, you'd need you know tax practitioners to answer that question who should we expect to do that regulatory impact is it is it, is it something that falls within the obrs or the sfc's brief or is it something that we well it, it's not for? something no. it's not something that we would do for a UK, for an equivalent uk change uh, i mean if if we thought that there you know that you were doing something which was likely to change business behavior at a macro level then we might think about that but it's more the sort of thing that in the uk context changes of this sort are generally accompanied by a regulatory impact assessment or some assessment of the costs imposed on businesses and, and consumers. I don't know whether what the arrangements are here for that, whether it's whether it's done or or not, okay. to be honest. Thanks. I don't know if the officers indicated they want to ask any more questions. So, Robert, thank you. During your opening, you stated that um, it's the second year in a row that you'd been our first witness in the year. I think that's probably been to our significant advantage because <laughs> you're able to deal with such detailed and complex issues in such a simple manner. Gets mark. you off to a cheerful start. Well, <laughs> but it's also the realism you bring to it, which is very refreshing. So thank you for that. And we may do the same to you again next year. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. So thank you for giving us your time. Thank you very much. And I just I suspend this meeting until we change over witnesses.
Um, welcome back, colleagues. The second item on today's agenda is the evidence on the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19 from Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Constitution. Um, as part of today's proceedings, we'll be uh, predominantly and primarily con concentrating on revenue issues. And obviously, when we get to Aberdeen on Monday, we'll turn more to the issues about the Constitution. Sorry, the expenditure, not the Constitution. <laughs> <You're obsessed>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been obsessed with the Constitution and, <laughs> and, clo and Clause 11 and the EU Bill for too long. Um, Mr Mackay is joined today by Scottish Government officials Aidan Greaswood, who is the Deputy Director of Fiscal Responsibility Division, Simon Fuller, the Deputy Director of the Economic Analysis Office of the Chief Economic Advisor, and Andrew Chapman, who is the Team Leader for the Fiscal Delivery and Constitutional Change. It was your fault, Andrew, putting that constitutional in, obviously. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, this is an interesting time uh, when you have a, ob obviously proposed new Sorry, you want to make an open statement? That may be a good place to start. Uh, that would be helpful, I, I think, uh, convener, uh, and then uh, can open up to committee. And can I wish all of the uh, committee and officials a <laughs> happy new year? Uh, this is indeed uh, an interesting uh, and exciting time in terms of the use of our uh, devolved function and devolved uh, powers. Uh, undoubtedly quite an uh, uncertain and what has been internationally, globally, a, a, an uncertain and, and turbulent time. Uh, through the course of uh, composing the draft budget, I've tried to deliver both stability and stimulus and sustainability for our public uh, services uh, as well. So amidst uh, very challenging circumstances, the uh, draft proposals reflect our determination to use those powers to grow our economy, build a fairer country, uh, build a, a Scotland we want to in invest in, live in, uh, work in and support our public uh, services. And of course, uh, supporting our businesses to develop and thrive is a, is a key part of that. Uh, taxation proposals are, of course, uh, central to uh, all of that, raising the necessary uh, revenues to be able to invest in our society and our public services. So the budget outlines the uh, spending plans and the uh, uh, revenue plans. I also hope that some of the recommendations from uh, the uh, budget review group in this committee have been taken into account in terms of presentation and responding uh, to that um, as well. So key features of the uh, draft budget uh, this year, uh, of course, uh, underpinning the budget is the a uh, new role of the Scottish Fiscal Commission in producing their independent forecasts for the economy. Whatever any of us may think about any element of uh, uh, the Fiscal Commission's forecast, the fact of the matter is that they underpin uh, the budget. Uh, therefore, we are relying upon uh, those uh, forecasts in tax revenues and social security uh, spend. And I very much thank them uh, for their work uh, and engagement uh, over um, the period. The uh, committee, of course, has taken much evidence from uh, members of the Commission uh, and others, uh, and the Chief Executive, uh, looking at both forecasts and uh, methodologies uh, during your uh, uh, inquiries. Um, as I've said, it's not just a matter of their opinion. Uh, their forecasts, of course, uh, relate to the block grant adjustment and the OBR forecasts, which uh, underpin our budget uh, numbers. Uh, most substantial, uh, of course, uh, uh, a income a lever uh, is around uh, income tax, which now accounts for over £12 uh, billion. Pounds, and HM Treasury uh, releases the funding uh, on the basis of those uh, forecasts and, and revenues. Uh, the second uh, major uh, innovation in the budget this year uh, is around how we propose to use those income tax powers. And I think it was very um, uh, helpfully a, very helpful that we had engagement with Civic Scotland and others when we published the discussion paper on the role of income tax in Scotland's budget. And it was good practice uh, to, to have engaged in that fashion and set out the principles that the Scottish Government uh, supports and how we would uh, deploy those income tax powers around protecting lower income earners, uh, supporting public services, uh, protecting the economy and using the tax system in a progressive uh, way. And again, whatever the uh, difference of opinion is on the outcome of that discussion paper, I think we can take great heart from the confidence and competence around the paper and the impartial analysis of uh, political parties' propositions uh, therein. Um, as well. But it was that consultative approach with Civic Scotland that ensures that we are prepared to implement our income tax powers in any changes uh, competently and effectively and giving as much notice um, as uh, possible. 
I think members of the committee will be very familiar with the budget's uh, uh, draft uh, uh, proposals, but just to re-emphasise some of the key proposals uh, within it, uh, in setting out income tax proposals, it will mean that 55% of taxpayers, those earning up to £26,000 a year, will pay less tax than they would elsewhere uh, in the UK, making Scotland the lowest tax part of the UK for the majority of taxpayers, and I would argue the fairest taxed part uh, of the UK, with the, the best deal uh, in terms of expenditure and entitlements uh, also. <laughs> Having uh, carefully considered all available evidence on market performance and forecasts, I propose to keep the rates and bans for land and building transaction tax as they are at present. And I have, however, proposed the introduction of a first-time buyer's relief, which would have the effect of raising the zero rate threshold for first-time buyers to £175,000. I've also set out our proposals for Scottish landfill tax rates. They will rise in line with inflation and continue to match rates in the rest of uh, the UK. And on business rates, we will provide the most competitive relief package in the UK, worth a record £720 million, up from £660 million in 2017-18 which includes several measures unique to Scotland to stimulate and support um, business growth in Scotland, such as the Growth Accelerator and proposals to delay rate triability until occupation uh, for new buildings, uh, as well as supporting small business bonus, which uh, should uh, lift over 100,000 properties out of rates uh, altogether. And of course, the number one ask of business was to move to CPI from RPI for business rates poundage. Um, uplift. So, as committee uh, would expect, um, uh, these proposals have been considered in great detail and in conjunction with the Adam Smith principles around you know, efficiency and certainty and proportionality, progressivity, and um, so on and so forth. I'm happy to take questions on the um, revenue aspects uh, of the budget. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. As you say, it's an interesting time and you've proposed new uh, rates and bans for Scottish income tax. It means, obviously, your budget now is much more dependent upon the performance of the Scottish economy relative to the UK economy. Therefore, could you give the committee some insight into how you've changed the way the Scottish Government may have approached the budget this year in the draft budget and your plans for future years? Well, I think it's fair to say I mean, all politicians in Scotland should always have been mindful of economic uh, growth, sustainable economic growth, and what can be done to stimulate uh, uh, the economy. It, 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 draw, it draws, I think, a closer focus on what needs to be done to support economic uh, growth. That includes tax decisions and creating the right environment for economic growth. A, and absolutely part of that is in delivering quality public services and creating the kind of society that we want to live in and having a fairer society. But to deliver economic growth, yes, arguably we have all had to look that bit closer at what we can do to support economic growth. So. I think, I think the Scottish Government ministers will always, of all administrations, look at the best way to grow the economy. But now there's a, a, an added reason to do it because it does affect the, the resources we will have to spend on public services in Scotland. So in, in terms of looking at it, yes, there's been a, a, an even stronger focus on um, economic spending, economic industrial interventions, a, a tax environment that takes a balanced approach to grow the economy. Uh, in, a, in a stable way. So the, the process of undertaking is to ensure in approaching how we spend resources and how we raise resources that we're very mindful of economic growth. Now, I'm sure, because there has been much commentary, uh, there will be questions around uh, forecasts uh, for Scotland, but arguably you could say that the, uh, that has led to an even stronger emphasis on uh, economic interventions, uh, business support. But something arguably even more substantial than that, and that's working age population and migration, absolutely critical factor in the economic success that, that, that Scotland will enjoy. And for that reason, um, maybe it does relate back to the Constitution after all, uh, but that is clearly a, a determinant in the economic forecasts uh, that have been set out by the SFC uh, and others. But in the thinking of ministers, um, it is absolutely front and centre, because if we don't make the right decisions on the economy, we'll have less resources to spend on our public services, naturally. Okay. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, there's also been some commentary on the budget settlement from the UK government and claims that it's been increased with counter-claims that the resource spending has been cut in real terms. For the record, I think it would be useful for the Scottish Government to put on 
uh, your position on record for the purposes of the committee of what you understand the situation to be? Well, convener, I think this uh, this becomes the, the annual ritual between uh, Mr Fraser and myself and then others play in in terms of interpretation of uh, uh, resources. It's a feature of the budget. Why change it? Um, I, of course, well, you, you play in uh, uh, real terms increases, uh, the difference between resource and capital, um, uh, financial transactions. I mean, fundamentally, uh, my point would be that over the 10-year um, period from spending uh, review about 2010, over the 10-year period, our overall uh, resources are down in real terms by about 8 per cent, and that's a £2.6 uh, billion pounds, uh, reduction. Now, if we take one year to the next, because you know, I suppose people are most interested in that, uh, going into financial year 18-19, uh, it is the case, and I welcome the resources on, uh, on capital, and I actually welcome the resources on financial transactions. But I made the point that for resource from 2017-18 into 18-19, it's a £211 million reduction, and then half a billion pounds reduction over two years for resource. Why do I make that distinction? Because that's the, that's the fiscal resource we have available to fund. A, our frontline services, uh, be it uh, the health service or, or uh, a, other, other frontline services. And, and that's the key point. That's what's been uh, most severely affected by uh, the UK government's uh, spending decisions. And then, of course, you, you, as I say, you, you can go beyond that and talk about the Barnet consequentials. Again, they're over a four-year period. This is a £2 billion figure, but it was largely financial transactions. I welcome financial transactions. We will use them to grow our economy, but I can't use them to invest in frontline public services, such as um, uh, school education delivery uh, or hospitals. No, of that £2 billion figure, over half of that was financial transactions. Um, so... Budgets are complex, but there has been a real terms uh, a reduction going into 1819, and that's why the government is proposing uh, to turn a, a resource uh, a real terms reduction uh, into a positive real terms increase by using our tax powers in the fashion that we've described. Thank you much, uh, Willie. Coffey, I think you've got a question. I hope set the picture around the issues Hi. that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned around four key tests. Yeah, OK, thanks very much, Bruce, and uh, good morning, Derek. Uh, in the discussion paper, the tax discussion paper, you set out four key tests uh, that, you, that you proposed at the time. One, to mitigate UK government spending cuts. Two, to make the system more progressive. Three, to protect low earners. And four, to support economic growth. Could you, could you outline to us how you've managed to achieve these four aims within your proposals and perhaps illustrate in each of those categories what you've done? Well, I believe that we've held true to those four um, tests. May I recognise that uh, the government is in a parliament uh, of minorities and a compromise will have to be found uh, on uh, income tax. So in approaching the issue, we wanted to create a, quite a transparent, um, engaging debate in advance of decisions being taken on a income tax, uh, recognising uh, that there were options in uh, changing the number of bans and the, and the, threshold, the thresholds um, uh, uh, and rates as well. So I think it was right to take that uh, consultative, collaborative approach uh, with stakeholders uh, in advance. So in setting out uh, the test, we tried to give a degree of uh, certainty as to what we were trying to achieve, um, because uh, one of the tests is to ensure that our decisions don't adversely affect uh, the economy. And I was very struck a few weeks before presenting the draft budget that we convened an inclusive growth conference in Glasgow, attended by key figures from the world of academia, economists, uh, finance, uh, uh, ministers past and present. Uh, and, and it was really important, I think, to set out progressive taxation, but also do it in a way uh, that doesn't uh, adversely affect the economy. So, again, I was struck that the IMF has said that progressive taxation uh, doesn't necessarily affect economic growth. So how I believe we've achieved all four is, well, first of all, in protecting our public services. We've gone from real terms uh, a decline in terms of that resource expenditure into real terms growth. So investing more by raising extra resources to invest in our public services, uh, that's what we're trying to achieve for our public services. And protecting lower 
uh, income earners, we believe we've done that in terms of introducing the, the starter rate and the figures that I've given uh, about um, uh, those who will be paying less tax. Now, I'm not going to say it's a massive reduction. You know, I don't want to... I don't want to overplay that, but it's structural change, and it's structural change that does benefit a majority of people, and as it happens, it's those that were lower earners uh, primarily. So I believe that we've protected uh, uh, those earning uh, less. Now, I believe that the tax system that we've proposed is more progressive because you know, it, it asks for a bit more from those who have more. That's the essence of progressivity. And, and, and takes a less from those who have less because of the introduction of the um, starter rate. Um, and yes, of course, there's the, the personal uh, allowance issue as part of that um, a, as well that can be taken into account. And I think in now restructuring the system to have uh, the, the five bands and, and not three, and I think that structural uh, uh, improvement also assists with tackling inequality and progressivity. And then it takes me to the final test of, of supporting the economy. Uh, you've seen the SFC report, uh, which has said they don't believe that our tax uh, decisions uh, taken into account with the spending decisions will have a net uh, negative uh, effect on the economy. They, of course, are just uh, forecasting, forecasting and modelling. But I think that the, the tax decisions then raise um, resources for investment in our public services, but also for business and innovation as well. Um, and when we come to spending, I suppose I'll talk more about the uplift in the economy portfolio or talk more about the industrial interventions or the um, skills interventions, i.e. support for higher further education, uh, international hubs, so on and so forth. So I'm saying it's a balanced approach, but I believe it has delivered uh, those four tests in the way that I've described. Thank you very much. Thank you. Murdo. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I think given the, the answer you gave to the Convener's second question, you'd be disappointed if I didn't pursue this issue of the size of the Scottish Government's budget. Um, so I'm not going to ask you about the overall size of the budget. I just want to ask you about your discretionary spend, which I believe is your, your preferred uh, measure. And looking at the block grant, therefore, is your discretionary spend either up or down in terms of uh, next year's budget compared to the current year? I think I've pointed out that overall, if you include capital and financial transactions, uh, it's up. But I've deliberately focused on resource because for the reasons that I've given. So you would accept, when Fraser Valentine Institute say, as they said in their economic commentary in December, the Scottish Government's total block grant, resource and capital, but excluding financial transactions, is on track to increase by around 1% between 2016-17 and 2019-20. You would accept that's correct? Yeah, I'm not objecting to that. Everything I've said so far is true, and this is the exchange we normally have. But I've focused, I think, for good reasons, specifically on resource, for the reasons that invest in frontline services. I've welcomed the capital and I've welcomed the financial transactions. And I've also taken the 10-year view. Why that time scale? Uh, because that's uh, the time scales uh, of uh, the spending review periods. Well, you say you welcome the financial transactions. I remember when they were announced, I think you described them as a con. Well, I would, if I had a choice, uh, Mr Fraser, between £2 billion to spend on our uh, uh, frontline uh, resource spending over financial transactions, I would take the resource spending. Why? Because I could spend it on health and education and other areas. You know, uh, but in terms of financial transactions, they are loans and they have to be paid back uh, to Treasury. Now, we can use them and we'll use them wisely, but I'm afraid they are not a substitute for uh, enhanced discretionary resource spending, which, as uh, Murdo Fraser knows, uh, could be well spent by many parliamentarians, including Tories who would quite like to spend it in that fashion as well. Well, I think we've accepted that financial transaction money is, is not a con, so perhaps we can agree on that point. But just, just, just one last point, if I can, on the, the question of the discretionary spend. I think you quoted a figure of 8% decline in discretionary spend since 2010. Fraser Valander, according to their briefing, states they believe the discretionary spend decline is 3.8 per cent since 2010. Not 8 per cent, 3.8 But perhaps more significantly, they, they go on to say that it is debatable whether or not comparisons just with 2010-11 are appropriate. 2010-11 marked the year when the Scottish Government's resource Dell budget was at its historic peak following years of significant growth. The 2017-18 resource Dell budget, in real terms, is around that in 2007-8. So if we take the 10-year period of the Scottish Government, the SNP Government, 
10 years you've been in office, the amount of money you have to spend today in terms of the block grant is roughly equivalent to what it was in real terms 10 years ago when you came to power. So over that 10-year period, according to Fraser of Allender, there has been no real terms cut. Do you accept that? Hey, no, I would refer Bertel Fraser to page 7 of the budget document that goes through the Treasury limits and the real terms change that we've outlined uh, using the figures that shows a real terms reduction from 2010-11 uh, over to the period 19 uh, 20. Uh, I suppose it is worth pointing out, uh, as Murdo Fraser has, has covered uh, the timescale issue again, that's the period of um, successive um, spending uh, reviews. So I think it is an appropriate time scale, a time scale. Uh, Murdo Fraser has also um, pointed out that, that some of these choices in terms of growth that otherwise could have happened is a choice. It's a choice about austerity. It's about a choice of controlling public expenditure. And it's a choice that the UK government has made. Now, it remains to be the case that if we had the same resources in real terms uh, that was achieved in 2010-11, yeah, you, you can make a, a view at that point in time, but at that point in the, in the, in, in the, in the term, um, then we, we would be better off uh, to the tune of £2.6 billion pounds now, fiscally, financially, and think of the difference that that would make in our public services. Now, as, as we move forward, so we can keep arguing about the past, and that's fine, I'm, you know, I, I'm you know, able to focus on that, but if we're looking forward, I've welcomed the capital and I've welcomed the financial transactions, but because of the resource reduction in real terms that requires difficult choices, yes, and it's also required us to use our tax powers in a fair and balanced way, and that's what I've proposed to make up for the decisions eh, of uh, the UK government before we even get into other financial disputes, whether it's real funding, whether it's the consequentials that we could have had if Scotland got a similar deal to Northern Ireland in terms of buying off the DUP, or how other uh, Barnet resources arguably have been bypassed. But fundamentally, the trajectory under the Tory government uh, has not been year-on-year -year real terms increases. But according to Fraser Valander, sorry, can we, this is my last point. According to Fraser Valander, over the 10-year period of this SNP government, there has been no real terms cut in your resource budget. Are they correct? No, I'm pointing out, and uh, once so the, again... So you're saying Fraser Valander have got this wrong? I'm happy to rely on our officials, our stats. Okay. You know, when it, comes to, when it comes to economists, you can have many different views. But I have shown repeatedly to Mr Fraser, when it comes to resource spending, there has been a real terms reduction to Scotland's budget, and Freda, Fraser of Allender Institute have said so as not, well. Not since 2007-08. The different baseline we're talking about. Here. Yeah, well, I've, I've, I, convener, I've, I've tried to outline why the 2010-11 baseline is important. Okay, interesting thing, though. It's uh, a annual. It's a it's a start of new year. <laughs> it wouldn't be the same without it. Um, Ive McKee. Uh, yeah, thank you, convener, and thank you, cabinet secretary, for coming along this morning. What I'm interested in is just um, exploring a bit further what work um, uh, is ongoing and, and what the budget is focused on in terms of supporting business and supporting growth in the economy. Maybe you could take the opportunity to outline a bit more detail around about what, um, what the budget does to support business. I'm focused, um, I'm happy to go into expenditure convener, but I can tell I would test your patience if I did too much of the spending uh, side. But just in terms of taxation and, and revenue, how that relates uh, uh, to business, I, I believe the income tax policies are one that um, are, are balanced, so it raises additional resources for uh, public services, actually for industrial and commercial intervention uh, as well. Uh, but the tax environment in itself, despite what you know, some people would gleefully argue, which undermines uh, Scotland, uh, Scotland is now, in terms of personal taxation, for a majority of taxpayers, the lowest tax part of the, uh, the UK. I think it offers the best deal. So that should attract, I think, uh, uh, people to Scotland because of the deal and the quid pro quo that, that there are offers for, for what people uh, pay. Uh, in terms of attracting um, businesses and growing businesses, I think the business rates policies are very significant around taxation. Barclay Review said that he would have recommended moving from RPI to CPI on the business rates poundage if he thought it was affordable. Now, I know it had a revenue neutral uh, remit, but the considerations and evidence he was able and the panel was able to give me uh, allowed me to develop that thinking. 
uh, further. So again, I would argue that having the best package of business rates relief anywhere in the UK, supporting particularly small businesses was significant. Uh, more support uh, for hydro and uh, the particular interventions around growth accelerator, no rates, liability and tall occupation are unprecedented anywhere in the UK. Why is that important? Because I believe it's a genuine, it's not just a tax cut for its own sake. I do believe they are stimulants for businesses to make decisions to improve, expand and enhance property. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. If a business wanted to make its property more environmentally friendly, less emissions, it would probably end up paying more Business rates, non-domestic rates, is a consequence immediately. So the growth accelerator even uh, supports interventions like that, rightly so, because it gives a period of grace uh, for a, you know, a, a, a non-domestic properties to, to the benefit from, from enhancement improvement or, the, or, or indeed a new build or speculative a new build as well. So all of that, I think, puts us at uh, an advantage, frankly, and which is uh, which is very helpful in making Scotland uh, even more um, uh, competitive. And again, despite some um, politically charged commentary, uh, most of the uh, responses I have seen to the budget have welcomed it as a balanced approach, and that includes for business as well. Thank you. Um, Patrick, you've got a, a, a supplementary to this. Just a, a very brief supplementary. Okay, as long as it's brief, because I know you've got uh, questions yeah, you want yeah, to ask. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, just on, on non domestic rates, uh, you, you mentioned the, the fact that the Barclay Review had been given a remit to be cost neutral. Uh, and you know, I, I might criticise that decision, that narrow remit, rather than a, a comprehensive review uh, of local taxation. But the, the briefing that we've got now. Uh, refers to the to the cost neutral uh, remit that it was given, but then says that the the policy reforms largely flowing from the review will cost 96 million uh, in 2018-19. So it's not in fact cost neutral. Uh, we've had evidence from uh, others who suggest that the reductions uh, in revenue from non-domestic rates roughly take up the the majority of the extra revenue that you're saying you're raising from income tax, which you say is for public services. Uh, is that accurate? Does the majority of what you're raising from income tax get given away uh, as non-domestic rate cuts? Wait, well, no. I mean, the, th the figures that have been cited are correct. It is approximately £96 million as a consequence of the Barclay recommendations and how I've gone further than the Barclay uh, recommendations. Of course, the other side of Barclay non-domestic rates is there were recommendation in Ken Barclay's report on how to raise revenue and Parliament doesn't have the appetite to see them through. For example, Alios. Now, of course, I concur with that view, but I make the point that Parliament is largely supportive of the a, a interventions to support business growth and, and enhance reliefs and so on, notwithstanding the position of, of the Greens, maybe the Labour Party too. But overall, um, there was a lot of support for a lot of the growth interventions in Barclay, non-domestic rates interventions, and not so much growth when it came to the revenue raising element of it. Maybe more support uh, around some of the smaller uh, revenue raising elements of it, uh, such as a independent mainstream uh, schools, a not uh, having a uh, rates relief uh, going forward. A, but I think that's why there's a difference in what Barclay recommended and then what's come out in the financial outturn. A, that said, I think that the measures around non-domestic rates are a, necessary. I mean, uh, you know, there's an argument about <laughs> we've had the Laffer curve uh, debate in, in the past. I, 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 no, certainly not from Patrick Harvey. And his, uh, um, I'm not even sure Murdo Fraser would use Laffer curve uh, analysis uh, anymore, having seen some recent commentary. But, but my point is this. I think each tax has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you're disputing what we've been told by others, uh, that the non-domestic rate tax cuts take up the majority of the extra revenue that's being generated from income tax changes? No, the overall policy um, decisions on income tax plus the, the, the element of <laughs> a methodology change as well uh, leads to an increase in £366 million in, in income tax. Um, OK, only part of that is this current year's uh, budget proposals, but that's the total <laughs> amount uh, derived uh, from government decisions around income tax. Uh, but... 
uh, this year it's uh, 164 million as a consequence of our policy decisions. I'm just saying again that each tax has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, Parliament has a choice. Yes, Parliament can say don't spend £96 million on a non-domestic rates uh, relief or, or make different choices. Uh, but it's my uh, position that some of those very specific and substantial interventions, the growth accelerator and no rates liability and tall occupation, will, I believe, uh, lead to a stimulus in economic activity, particularly in property, uh, because it is an advantage that Scotland has. Um, so I simply make the point that those interventions that should lead to further economic uh, growth, each tax should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis Parliament can make choices, but I believe that that's the right balance in personal taxation to raise revenue and on non-domestic uh, rates uh, 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 interventions to support growth of our economy and uh, respond to the Barclay report in a balanced way. But it's true to say that uh, the elements that would have made up revenue to help fund the, the expenditure elements of Barclay uh, don't, wouldn't have the support of Parliament. Thank you. Okay, Adam. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I want to ask you a number of quite detailed questions about the implications of your proposals with regard to um, income tax. So you said um, uh, a few moments ago that you're using um, uh, the Scottish Parliament's tax powers in a fair and balanced way. Those were your words. So according to the SPICE um, analysis of the proposals, Cabinet Secretary, um, those earning between 33,000 and 43,000 will pay more tax next year than this year, but those earning more than 43,000 up to 58,000 will pay less tax next year than in this year. How is that fair and balanced? What kind of behaviour are you trying to incentivise or disincentivise by giving those tax cuts and those tax rises to those well, different brackets of salary? There are some elements of a policy where you may not set out to have that intended consequence. And what that is, what that relates to is the decision last year to freeze the higher rate threshold. We're not proposing to do that in these proposals uh, this year. Uh, we're proposing to increase it in line with inflation. So it creates what I have admitted is a, a, an anomalous situation. Uh, but in resetting the a tax structure in the way that we have done uh, creates that anomaly. So I'm not set out to say, right, there must be a bracket uh, uh, that is treated differently, but it, it is coming, stemming from essentially the structural resetting of the whole system, which introduces a new starter rate, has the intermediate rate, it uh, has the, the thresholds um, in terms of the higher rate uh, raised in line with inflation. It creates that unintended consequence for a particular um, a bracket, who, of course, if you take it over the two years in terms of you could argue that uh, people in, the, in that bracket weren't the beneficiaries last year because the higher rate was frozen, it benefit this year because I'm proposing to increase the higher rate and you take it over the two year um, period. And, and that's the reason for that outcome. It is anomalous, eh, but that's what happens when you have structural resetting and increase the higher rate threshold. That's the technical explanation as to why that's uh, come about. So it's an unintended consequence? I didn't say out to have a particular bracket that doesn't uh, uh, that is affected in, in, in that way. It's an unintended consequence of resetting the whole system and proposing to increase the higher rate threshold. OK. Um, I wonder what other unintended consequences there are lurking in these um, tax plans. Um, and you said in your um, opening uh, statement, Cabinet Secretary, that um, you were proud of the engagement with Civic Scotland that the Scottish Government had had during the course of the autumn. What kind of engagement have you had with the Treasury and with HMRC to ensure that there aren't unintended, other unintended consequences of your tax plans with regard to, for example, the married couples allowance? Well, as uh, Adam Tompkins would expect, uh, I engage uh, regularly uh, with uh, uh, ministers. Um, I'm assuming it's the same ministers in the UK government I'm dealing with. I haven't checked the latest uh, status of the UK government cabinet kerfuffle or, or, or reshuffle, but uh, I engage regularly with UK government ministers and 
He certainly saw as much early advance notice of the tax uh, uh, proposals as possible, because we are all familiar in this committee of the issues around timescales and notice. You know, Chancellor stands up, gives his budget, and I have uh, the three weeks uh, to propose uh, the Scottish budget. So uh, officials uh, work constructively and engage uh, um, uh, positively, and HMRC has advised uh, me uh, through officials that they are satisfied that the changes that we propose to make uh, to policy uh, can be delivered uh, administratively uh, and uh, effectively. Now, of course, what they would like is as much advance notice as possible if there are to be changes. Um, uh, timing certainly helps them, but there's constructive engagement as a matter of course and the practicality of the Scottish Parliament using its devolved functions competently. In real I was going to come back to your other question I assume oh, you're interested yeah. in. Because I think it's fundamental to know that officials do work uh, together. Uh, I'm going to say harmoniously, that might not be totally true, but, but certainly constructively to, uh, to make sure it works. In terms of those specific examples, uh, there are again a couple uh, of areas that uh, are not in our gift to resolve. They are uh, functions reserved to Westminster, administered by HMRC, uh, that are unintended uh, consequences of any divergence of policy. Not a reason not to diverge in tax policy, of course, I would argue, and anyone who believes in uh, devolution uh, would say so. But where there are any uh, anomalies, we would expect the UK government and HMRC um, to, to support that. So specifically, um, uh, officials have engaged uh, with HMRC uh, on that. Um, if it requires any um, a change, then I would encourage the UK government to do that, to ensure there are no unintended consequences. But essentially, we're not at a settled position yet, because HMRC continues to work uh, on the issues. But they're now familiar with our policies and should hopefully address any unintended consequences um, where they have uh, arisen. It may be helpful for officials to see more about more of the technical detail behind a, a, a marriage a allowance, if that's of assistance. Yes. Aidan? Yeah, so um, just on specifics of the discussion paper, it's actually very helpful in terms of engagement, early engagement with HMRC on potential scenarios, so to give them a heads up on where we're going without necessarily having the precise policy which we could share with them, which wouldn't be appropriate, obviously, to share in advance of the budget itself. Um, so on marriage allowance, um, specifically, we've already engaged with HMRC um, on that post-budget, um, as Mr Mackay, as the Cabinet Secretary said, that's a reserved um, matter. Um, there's a, an intention to make sure that um, that is resolved, um, if, if any, in, any unintended consequences well, that... Aidan, sorry, can, can you tell us, first of all, I don't know, need, I, I don't know about others, but I don't know what needs to be resolved. Can, so can you explain what the issue is so we know what's trying to be resolved? Yeah, so, so at, at, at present, essentially, um, um, a basic rate um, payers who are married are entitled to a £260 um, entitlement um, that's the maximum relief entitlement um, for 1819, um, and then as a consequence of the structural changes, um, there's a question around um, it, the intermediate rate that's been set, so the 21p rate, um, and, the, and also um, the, the, the fact that the higher rate threshold is lower than the UK equivalent. So there's a question is in terms of marriage allowance, um, do you stick to the letter around the basic rate? which means that those people on the intermediate rate lose that entitlement, or do you take a, a pragmatic approach um, that avoids that eventuality? Um, so we're working um, closely with the UK government. We understand that, uh, um, essentially, there's a minor legislative change that could be put in place that could, um, that could um, be corrected for this. That, again, is the UK government's um, gift to take that forward. Um, but as we say, it's, it's, it's early engagement, post-decisions that have been made, um, but there's, there are potential solutions um, to avoid that outcome. What is the policy intent? Is the policy intent for people in Scotland on the new intermediate rate to lose their entitled to, entitlement to the yeah. married couples allowance or not? The policy intent is you know, we, um, we can express a view, I mean, it's a policy that we don't control. We can express a view. My view is that Scottish taxpayers should continue to have that entitlement. It is then back to the Westminster government to make that change okay. or not. Now, they, they don't uh, they wouldn't lose out you know, by making the change, because for them it would be continuity. So I make the point that it's one of the anomalies that it's not a reason not to diverge in income tax policy. At maximum, it's £260 per couple right. relief for those affected, 
and could be resolved in advance of the new financial year with a minor technical change if the UK Government wishes to do it. Okay. If you foresaw this problem before you presented your budget proposals to Parliament last month, why, why did you not seek to resolve it with HMRC before coming to Parliament? No, we, I think uh, Mr Greaswood did say that we uh, do engage with HMRC. Um, the actual tax policy that I propose, Parliament hears it first, apart from the SFC for obvious reasons. Uh, so there's um, scenarios, there's discussions, there's engagement on potential anomalies in advance, there's engagement with civic society, and, and helpfully in civic society, and some of the tax experts, whether it's the Chartered Institute of Taxation or the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland, will, will, will volunteer issues they foresee with us, and we take that on board, work on it, engage with relevant agencies. But my point is here, even this budget is now out for consultation. And that's the purpose of this committee appearance, and we engage further with HMRC. And it is for them to then ignore the issue, ignore the anomaly, or resolve it. And the question I put back is, would Mr Tompkins say that in itself is a reason not to use or devolve powers, not to have divergence, because some intended consequences eh, 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 are, 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 are the outcome? But in looking at them, uh, we hope the HMRC will resolve them. Uh, I don't see any reason uh, that they won't. Um, and it then is back to Westminster politicians to respect the fact we have devolved functions and should be free to use them. Well, my, well, my view would be that devolved powers should be used in such a way that you've done your homework first and have thought about the uh, consequences so that they are intended and not unintended. No, that's not a fair, fair can characterisation. I, I made the point. I made the point that this was not a surprise to us, that we do engage on such matters, eh, and so there is no suggestion that we have not prepared for such anomalies. My point back is that not, these issues aren't within our gift to resolve. They are within Westminster's gift to resolve, and they should respect the fact that the Scottish Parliament is using its devolved functions in the spirit of Scottish democracy. And it's then for Parliament to decide whether we use these okay. powers or not, but on, not Westminster. But on, but on the substance of the married couple's allowance, you can't give us an assurance that people on the intermediate rate will not, be, will not, will not lose that allowance. Can we I move from I cannot give you the assurance that Westminster will see sense and ensure that the devolved powers in Scotland eh, are exercised fairly. But, right. but I, I have found, I have found in many other matters in relation eh, to the budget, eh, that they, that they uh, have been willing to take a constructive approach in a number of matters, and I hope they'll take a constructive approach in this as well. What about pensions? What about um, uh, lump sum pensions? To, uh, with respect, uh, um, there are. Um, uh, tax release available. How, how will that work through, given the restructuring of income tax that you are proposing in this budget? In terms of a tax relief, I make the same point that this will be a matter for HMRC uh, in terms of those um, reliefs. I want to make an overall point around pensions because I have seen it referred to elsewhere. Again, where there are relief anomalies, it's for HMRC to address, knowing what our tax policy is and know what our intended policy outcome is. But when it comes to tax relief, and specifically, say, on the issue of um, pensioners' lump sums, I suspect Mr Tompkins was, was probably going there uh, next, I would argue that our progressive tax policy it benefits most pensioners as well. benefits most pensioners because if they're uh, working, then they'll be uh, paying the progressive tax regime. And also, if they are drawing down a lump sum, then that would also be more progressive. And most people, the evidence and information I've seen, that most people drawing down a lump sum uh, are at uh, the lower end of the sums that they're drawing down, and therefore should benefit from a more progressive rates as proposed in the income tax uh, policy as well. This makes the point on some of these anomalies. As I say, the lump sum's a, a significant issue, but you know, the majority actually benefit from a more progressive tax regime, but it makes the point of the inadequacy of the current devolution settlement that we don't control every element of it. We don't control the reliefs, we don't control national insurance contributions. So where there are anomalies, it's not to say that the Scottish Parliament shouldn't exercise its power on income tax. I would argue that it suggests we should have all the powers around income tax, national insurance contribution and others, so that the system absolutely can be far more harmonious. Um, welcome the, the fact that we have this substantial income tax power, but any of the uh, anomalies that arise from not having control of the other powers suggest that we should. No. Okay, James. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I want to pick up on a couple of the points that have already been raised. Um, you 
You made the point when you were talking about the principles around the taxation changes that one of the principles was to um, to essentially offset austerity. Um, now, uh, Patrick Harvey questioned you about <coughs> the, the overall amounts raised in relation to income tax. You'll be aware of the Fraser of Allender Institute uh, analysis, uh, and they clearly demonstrate in their analysis that you know you, you raised, as you've stated, £164 million through tax. But when you take into account the, the business rate offset, uh, the, the LBTT um, change and support for carers allowance, there's actually only £28 million uh, available in terms of meeting these challenges of offsetting the austerity, not to mention uh, funding your uh, public sector pay policy. So in actual fact, the, the analysis shows that what you've actually produced is a, a weak set of tax proposals in order to meet the challenges that you've set yourself. No, I think what I've tried to do, um, as I've described, um, is deliver a balanced budget, one that supports the economy, one that protects our public services and invests in them, uh, lifts the public sector uh, pay cap, um, but if asked the question, is this budget pro-business? Yes. As well as being pro-public service, as well as being uh, oh. pro-sustainable uh, pro, uh, economic growth, uh, as well as being uh, uh, all of that, you know, pro-NHS, a higher than inflation increase in the National Health Service, yes, I do also believe uh, that it's pro-business as well. I think it's the right thing to do to grow our economy for the reasons that we, we gave at the, uh, the start of this uh, evidence session. Uh, but a balance, a balance in tax, using our tax powers in a fair and uh, progressive way to raise extra resources. And as I say, the decisions that the government's taken last year and this year around income tax specifically result in an extra £366 million for expenditure uh, on, our, on our public uh, services. So we've done it in a balanced way. Um, and again, whatever we think of the Fiscal Commission forecast, they underpin um, our a budget. And in taking the tax decisions, I, I've tried to ensure that we meet the four tests as I've uh, described to, to Mr Coffey. So I think it's a balanced budget. I think it is one that protects our uh, public services, invests uh, in a fairer society, uh, protects the, the, the country from the uh, welfare reforms as best we can from the UK government, uh, and invests in the future. Uh, and that includes investment in infrastructure as well. So I would not accept uh, the charge uh, uh, that Mr Kelly has made. How can you say that it's a pro-public service budget when the evidence clearly shows that when you work through the tax changes, there's only £28 million available to uh, offset the, the impact of austerity and cuts? Through the number of decisions that the government's taking, we're investing more than inflation for the National Health Service. We're lifting the public sector pay cap. I believe we're protecting local government uh, in terms of uh, resource and capital. There is record investment in housing to meet our, uh, our, our affordable housing target. There's new interventions for um, a broadband uh, as well. And there is uh, the mitigation of welfare reform too. So all of that is achieved uh, by this uh, budget. That's how I say it's pro-public service, because it achieves all of those things uh, and more. Uh, I would certainly submit that it's highly questionable that it can be pro-public service when the amount of money raised that can be allocated to offset the public service cuts is only £28 million. Pounds. But moving on to... <coughs> The issue that Adam Tomkins raised around those uh, earning between 43,525 and 58,500 uh, paying less tax, is that something that you were aware of when you published your budget? Yes, and in the press briefing, um, uh, we, we were upfront about it. So aware of, I've explained it's anomaly. It's not something we, I set out to say, here's a... Here's a band of taxpayers that I want to be treated differently. It is a consequence of the structural change. A, the proposal to lift the higher rate threshold is part of that structural resetting. And if you take it over the two-year period, um, as I say, those people who were not the beneficiaries last year are the beneficiaries this year of that uh, outcome. 
But no, it's Pe not a big secret, Mr Kelly, no. Pe pe people understandably will be looking at uh, this year's budget. And do you not think that people uh, will view it as inconsistent, to say the least? You know, if you take somebody earning 42,000, they'll, they'll pay 90 pounds more. Somebody earning 55,000, uh, I'll pay £35 less in tax. You know, is that not a, a really inconsistent approach against some of the principles that you outlined at the start? I'd like to think that, uh, by definition, an anomaly is normally um, consistent. I make the point that this is resetting the tax system. This is structural change. This is delivering a fairer system overall. This is addressing the fact that it's normal normal to increase thresholds in line with inflation, but it is a choice, but that's, that's normal. Um, and from all of that, I do believe we've delivered a system. Of course, we have to abide by the SFC forecast, but a system that raises and policy choices that raise £164 million, that's fairer, that's more progressive, that doesn't adversely affect the economy, that ensures for a majority of taxpayers it's the lowest tax part of the UK, and for 70 per cent of taxpayers they pay less, not more, and those who are paying more have more, and that contributes to a better and a fairer society. In delivering that structural change, then there is this uh, anomaly uh, within it, but that's the outcome of this, as I say, overall restructuring of the tax system in which we're introducing two new bans. Is it not the case that rather than being a progressive set of tax changes that they're actually weak and incoherent? Weak in the sense that uh, they, they only raise a minimal amount of money to offset public service cuts and incoherent in that you've got inconsistency in the, the tax rates and changes that have been brought forward? You know, I, I think tax, to, to be fair, um, and, and I'm sure Mr Kelly wants to be fair, tax is a very complex area. I think we've covered some of that this morning. And to make such a substantial change um, in resetting uh, the system, as I say, there will be some complexities uh, within it. I don't know of any commentator, frankly, who has said this is anything other than progressive. I don't know any economist, any commentator who said it's anything other than progressive. A politician may argue it doesn't go as far as they want, but there is consensus, it's competent, it's been constructive, it has been uh, engaging, and it's been a good way to do policy by engaging in advance to make sure we can iron out any issues and uh, hear from people what they think about it, uh, whether it's trade unions or uh, whether it's the business community, whether it's taxation uh, experts or others. Everyone's agreed that it's progressive. How far you wish to go, that's a matter uh, uh, for others. But I would argue it is a major step in delivering a fairer structure and the rates and thresholds within that, I would argue, are fairer um, uh, uh, as well and certainly better than the, the previous uh, structure uh, that we had. Uh, whilst uh, at the same time raising extra resource for Scotland's uh, public services. And then, of course, it's the discretion of the Parliament as to how it spends those resources. But as you say, taken together last year and this year's uh, decisions, it's amounted to an increase in the uh, resources we will have to spend. And interestingly, of course, the Fiscal Commission on current forecasts suggests that um, income tax uh, uh, forecasts will continue to rise in Scotland, even if that's not the same for GDP. Wage growth and, uh, will match uh, the UK, uh, and income tax uh, receipts for Scotland should be in a strong uh, position. Emma. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in the, the structural changes that you're describing and how it's going to benefit people. And in the first three tax bans, I see that like many of the employees in the first three tax bans are women. 89% of nurses are women, most healthcare support workers are women, most people in the caring community are women. So this budget, the draft budget, directly reflects what the Scottish Government has as far as the equality agenda. But also, can you describe the benefits, I guess the further benefits, of the first three tax bans and was that a conscious decision that to include women? There is, there is um, equality thinking when we are composing the, the budget, both in um, uh, revenues and expenditure as well. And I think it is fair to say, as Emma Harper has done, that uh, in delivering a more progressive system, it, uh, it does benefit um, uh, 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 women, um, uh, as well as at the expenditure side, well, too, when we come to that, whether it's childcare or education, 
um, uh, or the other um, uh, entitlements uh, specifically. But because of the uh, composition of the workforce, uh, and this includes within pay policy as well, um, beneficiaries uh, of that in terms of uh, lower paid uh, will be um, uh, women too. So in making sure that our pay policy and our tax policy is aligned as well as overall expenditure equality, it has been um, a forefront in our mind. Anything else, Emma? No, uh, no, I'm quite happy actually with this benefits because of the feedback I'm getting from people is uh, quite happy with it. Okay, Patrick. Thank you. Um, just uh, picking up on this uh, anomaly again that a couple of other members have, have asked about. Um, the way you've described it almost sounds as though it's it's an unfortunate but inevitable consequence of what you're doing. Uh, it's not inevitable, is it? You, you've described it as as a, a great restructuring, and I'm, I very much welcome that. I've argued for a restructuring of income tax bans for, for some years now. But if we're restructuring uh, income tax, uh, that seems to me an ideal opportunity to set the bans and the thresholds as we think they ought to be rather than to base them on an inflation calculation uh, deriving from the old abandoned structure. Why do that? I think I've tried to cover those points, and at no point I've said it's not a choice. I've said it is a choice to Parliament as to where we set the thresholds. It is just normal uh, that thresholds increase in line with inflation, but it is a choice. And it's also true to say in restructuring it, we can set uh, within our competencies the a bans a, and rates, a, a thresholds, a, where we want them to be. I'm just saying take a two-year view that those who uh, didn't benefit uh, last year are beneficiaries this year of that structural change. But yes, Parliament can choose otherwise uh, in terms uh, of that. Uh, and I've tried to uh, describe uh, how we've arrived at the structure. Uh, I could I can say more, but essentially it is increasing the higher rate threshold that we didn't do last year. As if Patrick it's... Harvey well knows, uh, uh, that was uh, that was necessary for uh, you know uh, the budget to be supported. That's just a fact of uh, the uh, engagement last year. If it's normal to increase thresholds by inflation, let me ask a question that you didn't properly answer last year. Why don't you want to increase the top rate threshold by inflation? Because we've looked uh, at the structure, we've looked at the tax base, we've engaged with, as I say, a number of stakeholders on what the tax system should look like. And the structure right now is where we think it should be. I think from memory that would be in the top rate of tax about uh, 19,000 people in that particular uh, band. Of well, course, for, we've forgive me, you, you say you've consulted and asked people about this, but all of the approaches outlined in your discussion paper uh, on the role of, of tax in the Scottish budget. All of them were based on uh, a higher rate threshold, uh, which is an inflation-based increase from uh, where it currently is, and a top rate threshold, which is precisely where it currently is. So you haven't actually consulted people or asked people about what the, the options might be. Every single option that you put forward was based on that assumption that you're going to increase the higher rate threshold by inflation. But I can assure Mr Harvey that in inviting political parties to put submissions to the tax uh, discussion paper, they could send me any submission in any composition that they liked. I did actually specifically in my request for submissions ask for views around thresholds and inflationary assumptions uh, as well. Mm. Um, and the, the, approaches, but, but, the approaches in the discussion well, paper can I come were to not that? Because the discussion from paper, other parties. They were yeah. your approaches. I was, I was about to come to that as well. I'm just making the point that I have been responding to political parties in what their submission was to that exercise. And then in the subsequent engagement I had, you know, people were perfectly free to make uh, suggestions beyond our um, illustrative uh, modelling. Mm -hmm perfectly free to make alternative suggestions. I have to say, of all the engagement I had, I didn't get a lot of you know, a push or questions around the thresholds for the top rate of tax, the additional rate, frankly. There were more questions around whether it was the, a, the, uh, a, the, the rates or maybe assumptions that people had made. But I had, did have an open mind to people engaging on other matters. I think that the, the balance was struck as the right one, though. 
in terms of the composition of the tax base, a understanding as best we can the behavioural effects, and then arriving at a system that will generate the right amount of out, 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 uh, income and revenue. Uh, and in terms of top rate, um, obviously a very specific argument uh, around that, but trying to ensure that we raise the optimum amount of money for next year. Uh, to be clear, just as with last year, I wasn't suggesting that we should increase the threshold for the top rate. I'm suggesting that it's a, there's an anomaly, and the fact that you're not doing so, uh, you know, really challenges your, your claim that it is normal to increase thresholds. What you've what you've done uh, is produce a set of proposals that are based <coughs> on an assumption uh, that high in, high earners, higher rate taxpayers, ought to get that that benefit uh, of a of a threshold increase. Can I ask what other alternative variations uh, you considered either in the development of that discussion paper or subsequent to the discussion paper in the development of your draft budget. What other options did you examine, cost out and then rule out of consideration for publication uh, alongside the draft budget? Uh, just to go back to the top rate tax specifically, I mean, of course, we haven't increased the threshold for the top rate tax. Now, the argument you can move it about, but that has remained static. I was making the point more about other uh, rates, just to be absolutely clear on that point. Uh, over the course of the uh, discussion paper, uh, the role of income tax in Scotland's budget, uh, leading to the draft budget, clearly I would look at different scenarios, what I thought... Um, what different numbers would mean, what would the outcome be. And the reason for that is, a, following on from the Chancellor's budget, I have a different set of numbers to work with. So I'm working to different budget figures. Um, it was still a fluid uh, position and it was still um, yet to be determined. So uh, I looked at, at uh, different modelling, different tax policies. And in real time, the civil service were trying to get a better understanding of the Fiscal Commission's modelling as well so that the civil service could get as close to SFC modelling as possible to understand what we propose. Will that be the outcome the SFC say it will be? Because that's then what I have to put in the budget. So that was a pretty intense period of exploring the numbers, a uh, fluidity uh, of um, uh, the numbers to arrive at the final proposition that I gave to the SFC that they put in the document, of course, then informs this draft budget. So it was pretty fluid during that period. That they were considered. Uh, the, the, the proposal in the draft budget is closest uh, of the approaches in the discussion paper. It's closest to approach four, that, that being the only one that has a 19, 20 and 21 uh, rate. The, the, the main difference is the absence of a, an additional band between 75,000 and 150,000, so the, the top end of that higher rate uh, range. Uh, you've, you've not included in that in your proposals uh, so I would ask whether uh, that was considered and why it was ruled out. And secondly, whether you considered a different threshold for the intermediate rate, it would be possible, for example, to set a higher threshold for that, uh, but levy it at a higher rate, thereby protecting people on middle incomes and even on slightly above the middle income, uh, but having a, a, a more progressive approach overall. Did you consider those two specific alternatives? And if so, why did you rule them out? I think um, I think I would want to revisit my working notes at the time. I've tried to describe fairly to Mr Harvey. It's a pretty fluid situation. So it wasn't just driven by um, what looks like the perfect structure. It was also driven by what are the needs around public sector investment, uh, what are the, the, the factors, what's the methodology from the SFC. So I think there was a range of factors going on a, at a, the time and the position we arrived at, as I say, that was an intense period, post-UK budget, getting the settlement numbers, understanding how the SFC was arriving at its modelling, assessing what the expenditure demands were going to be. So all of that was fluid at the same time as trying to ensure that the system and the structure and the, thre the thresholds were where uh, we wanted them to be. So there was, uh, there was a variety of uh, submissions that we had received naturally from from other political parties and considerations to take into account. It's true to say that the outcome is a hybrid a, a, of um, the illustrative approaches that were set out in document in terms of um, suggesting the introduction of a, a, a starter rate um, uh, as well a, as, as increasing uh, the number of bands overall. So as I say again, it was perfectly fluid. 
Uh, I applied the four tests um, and we looked at the numbers, we understood the modelling and the outcome is what I've proposed in the, the draft budget. Uh, I wanted to come on to reconciliation as well. Later on? Okay, thank you. Matter. Ash, you wanted to cover issues around pay policy. Thank you. Yeah, recently, obviously, there's been a change in uh, the public sector pay policy, um, you know, the lifting of the 1% pay cap. So, obviously, that's going to result if that goes ahead in pay rises across the public sector. What are then the implications of that policy in terms of the revenue raising? I believe the SFC built the uh, pay policy um, figures into their forecasts, um, which uh, generated a sum of about uh, £55 million for income tax as a consequence of pay policy as proposed. OK, thank you. OK, um, Neil, on the issues to do with thanks. local government. Yeah, thanks, Kimberly. Council tax. Ca yeah, in relation to, to, to council tax. It Earlier today, he said Scotland is not just the fairest tax part uh, of the UK, but for the majority of taxpayers, the lowest tax part of the UK. And, and I think in your budget statement, you also said that you are safeguarding those on low incomes. Can I ask, have you taken into account the impact of a 3% rise in council tax across the board um, when making these statements, and particularly on those on low incomes? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, well, at the moment, it remains the case that um, in terms of uh, council tax, it's still lower in average than it is. Uh, south of the border, um, and that's even with the, the changes to the, the higher uh, value properties uh, last year. So, yes, I'm convinced that if a council chooses to use its power to raise uh, council tax by up to 3%, it shouldn't have a disproportionate effect on household budgets. I think the council tax freeze was necessary at the time, uh, but now I also believe it uh, to be the case that local authorities should have that discretion to uh, increase council tax. Um, I don't know if we're now turning to settlement issues, but just in terms of um, we're not. Uh, just in terms of that, yes, I, fe I feel that the three percent is proportionate, and many, including uh, Neil Bibby, have argued in the past that you know councils should have that discretion to increase the council tax, and it's now for them to determine whether they use it or not. Of course, as part of council tax, there's council tax benefit, which safeguards people, including uh, uh, low-income earners, uh, single people, pensioners, and others as well. Do you not accept that if um, people in those low incomes whose tax liabilities may only reduce by ten or twenty pounds, excluding the changes to personal allowance, um, this could be more than wiped out by a three percent increase in council in council tax, and the end result, the consequence, could be as a result of your decisions that those on low incomes actually pay more tax when you include council tax, uh, council tax. as a result of the decisions that you make. The council tax is not the decisions of the Scottish Government, it's a decision of uh, local authorities. I would argue, of course, uh, as Mr Bibby would expect, that local governments have got a fair settlement uh, from uh, the Scottish Government, but whether or not they choose to increase council tax uh, is up to them in dialogue with their local communities. Yeah, I understand it's a, a decision for the, for the councils to make, but I just think that we need to look at the, 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 the overall tax take on people well, when it comes I, I, in the I, I, round and include those, I and I would quite, encourage you to look I, at the impact. No, that is a very fair question. Of course eh, I should look at taxation in the round and arriving at my decisions, and I think income tax is a substantial um, a engagement and a substantial shift this year to make it fairer, more progressive, uh, and restructure it. And I'm looking forward to seeing the Labour Party's position on income tax, which I'm told is imminent. It would have been helpful it came before the discussion paper, after the discussion paper, during the course of the parliamentary discourse. Every other party seemed to want to engage in it. And even after the Labour Party found a new leader, um, I still didn't get a tax position. But I'm delighted to hear that I know the income tax policy of the Labour Party. And maybe the Labour Party should take into account the Labour Party's position on income tax when it, uh, it drives a position on council tax as well. Right. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that, Kevin. Um, you've, um, <laughs> you've, uh, you've said that you've you've said that if councils raise council tax um, by three percent, then it will give seventy million, seventy-seven million pounds extra revenue for uh, for councils to to spend. And we can we'll, we'll have a debate uh, next week about you know the impact of that um, and, on, on spending. But why have you why have you not provided that £77 million extra through income tax? Is it not more progressive to raise that £77 million through income tax, your own income tax progressive proposals, <coughs> and through council tax? I, I think it's fair to say that um, a, the, a, the income tax uh, policies I'm proposing are more progressive. 
uh, by their nature, income tax was progressive. I, but I think it makes it more progressive, uh, progressive in, in changing it as we've proposed. If we go back to the debate on council tax, what Parliament voted on, what Parliament agreed to say, uh, was that we should continue engagement on reforming council tax. I'm happy to do that. But we need to go beyond just providing a critique of the uh, Scottish Government and into what alternatives it might look like. And I think the responsibility is on the opposition to do that as well. Uh, do I happen to think that the income tax is more progressive than council tax? Yes, I do. Uh, by nature of the fact that it accurately, more accurately assesses uh, income. A uh, council tax, of course, is a property tax, not an income tax. Um, and therefore, it's assessing the value of property. And then there's other safeguards and checks within that as well. Uh, but I, I think with the, to be fair, um, substantial change to income tax to deliver a fairer society, we need a degree of stability right now. And if we're to make any changes to the council tax system, uh, then we should engage constructively in that. And that's the, the, the plea I've put out to um, all opposition parties on that. It, I think I have a adequately supported uh, a local government. Um, I've set that out uh, at the budget. I've engaged with local government. I've met a number of leaders. I met with um, COSLA. Uh, and I know, as a matter of fact, that the settlement that's proposed is far better than they were anticipating. Um, it also delivers uh, a, a, a very small cash increase uh, uh, in uh, uh, their settlement. Uh, and if they use their council tax powers up to 3%, it delivers a real terms increase. Um, but that said, it is a matter of discretion for uh, local government. It's a strange, I mean, I maybe shouldn't get into the party politics, but it is strange that Labour members ask me about council tax increases when it was eight Labour authorities that didn't increase the council tax and at the same time say that those local authorities didn't have enough money. A strange argument to say that a council doesn't have enough money, therefore it proposes to raise less. A slightly different issue to what we've been discussing already, but uh, around budget adjustments, etc. But for the longer term, so, so Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Th this is a, a longer term uh, question about the the way in which the the forecasts of, of revenue raised would be reconciled uh, in in the longer term. So it's it's not specifically a question really about just this year's budget, but about how we do budgets generally under this new. Uh, arrangement, and I uh, obviously preface this with my usual apology for my share of culpability for the Smith Commission uh, and what it did. Um, the the income tax revenues, if the if the forecast is uh, wrong, uh, and it's it's unlikely to be absolutely spot on, but so to the extent that it's wrong, uh, the, the the forecast of income tax revenue that will be reconciled. Um, in time for the 2021-22 budget, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so, you know, one of the briefings that we've yes, we've had that. suggests that it's not uh, not implausible that that could be in the order of hundreds of millions of pounds. Is that a a, a realistic prospect that um, the, the 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 difference? that's adjusted at that point might be in the order of hundreds of millions of pounds in any one year. I don't want to cause alarm. Mm. It's plausible that that might be correct, but not necessarily likely, but possible mm. for the very reasons that Patrick Harvey has given. Uh, that They are only forecasts. Yeah. Uh, you're right, this is a product of the, the agreement, the system, the fiscal framework, that it is based on forecasts. Uh, block grant adjustment, and at the point of reconciliation, it may well be hundreds of million pounds or it may not be, and it might be either way, more or less. Yeah, it, would you like Simon no. Fuller to say more, as the yeah, sure, economist yeah. charged with forecasting <laughs> such matters? Yeah. No, just the only other point I would add to that is, you're right, the Scottish income tax forecast may be wrong, it will need to be reconciled, but what's really important for our budget is the difference in that error compared to the error that OBR was likely to make in forecasting block mm -hmm. grant adjustment. So it's a net effect of those two numbers, which will be really key. Mm -hmm. And you'd expect that net effect to be slightly smaller, perhaps, than any two individual effects. But as you say, it does vary, and mm. the forecast will certainly be different. Given, given that that kind of variance is possible, mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that it's likely, given that it's possible, uh, that there does need to be some willingness to work with that, that possibility <coughs> and, and take account of it. 
doesn't it slightly undermine uh, the argument that some have made uh, that the purpose of tax devolution was to make a Scottish government accountable for the tax decisions that it makes? Uh, if the consequences of the tax decisions that it makes are only really felt uh, toward the end of a parliamentary term when decisions were made at the start of it? It was interesting, Patrick Harvey, of course, was asking me, not a member of the Smith Commission at the time, but a beneficiary of its agreement in administering it as best I can I, as financial. I ask myself secretary. questions about this all the time. <laughs> well, I, I, I simply ask, I obviously support the devolution settlement, support the fiscal framework, uh, support the fact that we have more powers. I think we can all agree it's a pretty complex way mm, uh, to, to determine a budget. And the fact that the budget is underpinned by forecasts that are reconciled in a future year does bring those risks. It's a fair point, a fair analysis. What, so what behaviours does it generate? Um, I, think it'll, I think it would encourage us to ensure that we have future flexibility. Of course, there are mechanisms in place if there is a forecast error, such as the borrowing uh, capacity and facility, if that's required, if it occurs because of forecast errors. Uh, but arguably, Many of us have said that maybe the SFC's projections are a wee bit cautious. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good thing in that regard. It could be argued. Uh, but uh, it will be down to the reconciliation compared to, 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 to OBR. Uh, what, I, what I would say is I think it encourages us to have, whilst we've got that flexibility, whilst we've got borrowing powers in the event of a major discrepancy, um, I think it should encourage any finance sec secretary to have a, some medium-term financial planning as well, and that's something that the a, committee has encouraged, and I'm, I'm keen to, to do even more than has been done in the past, just as the, the functions of uh, the parliament have um, progressed and matured. I think, of course, we need to prepare for such scenarios. A, but the current projections, of course, eh, are good, but, but the point is, is a fair one. If you were to design the system eh, based on forecasts, carries risk. And, and I was just going to finish this up by asking what level of flexibility currently exists? And the, the, the committee, as well as the budget review group, have talked about uh, the lack of transparency that there's sometimes been around mechanisms that give the government flexibility year to year. Uh, and will you be arguing for any changes or additional forms of flexibility in order to mitigate against this kind of potential risk, whether in, in, in your own term in office or, or for the, the much longer term? It does relate back to the, the, I gave to, uh, the answer I gave to Mr Tompkins about um, well, essentially a maximalist position on fiscal autonomy, that the more, we ha the more control we have, the better. But it addresses anomalies. It would also give us more flexibility and more room for manoeuvre in event of such a scenario as Mr Harvey has uh, described. That said, it's a matter of public record what the uh, resource borrowing facility uh, looks like, what it could be. Um, and then uh, within that, again, if you look at budget uh, transparency enhancement in the budget document, and this is partly because of the budget review group, I'm not just set out what was traditionally set out, but on page 184, I set out other contributing factors to the budget as well. So that's the kind of new approach I've tried to take, be more transparent about beyond just um, tax and spend, what other elements are a feature, such as budget exchange um, as well. So I've tried to be... I mean, this is sometimes reported on outturn. I'm setting it out at the start of the year as part of the budget process, and that's uh, table one. So I think I've tried to improve uh, transparency. I'm trying to show that we are thinking ahead in terms of that modelling. It, and uh, the system is so complex it carries risk. I mean, you're talking about a few million pounds and some of the block grant adjustment for some of those taxes, and those are just the forecasts. Mm. And I think you've already been fully briefed by both the SFC and the OBR, and I'm sure you enjoyed the sessions on methodology and the, the factors that, that build up their um, uh, forecasts. Um, of course, ask two economists for, for, for a view. You're going to get a range of different uh, 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 answers. So I, I make the point that... The, there is uncertainty. It's the best estimate that each agency has provided, but the SFC is different from EY and it's different from Eason Fraser of Allender Institute as well. Uh, but there is a risk carried in how we conduct uh, this budget process arriving from the fiscal framework. But fundamentally, um, the Parliament exercising its new devolved functions is one that I think has is, is been well received. 
Uh, it's been the right thing to do. It makes us more accountable and engaged as a nation, and it hopefully can make the right policy interventions as well. And any risks it can be mitigated. The good thing is, of course, at that point of <coughs> sorry for going on at length on this one. Uh, come here. The final point I'll make is this: um, it, reconciliation shouldn't be a massive shift because the the forecasts and the assessments in year and the, the work of HMRC and actual outturn um, should be more yes. stable and certain than is currently envisaged because we're uh, using baseline yep. data that's not yet concluded because it's from 16, 17 and people haven't completed it. Uh, terribly complex. I appreciate the point, which is uh, as Thank best you. I can do to explain the, the Thank you. answer. I'll relieve Patrick from torturing himself from his time in the Smith Commission oh, and, the, oh and, the, and <laughs> the impact that's happened obviously on him since. And thank the Cabinet Secretary for coming along and giving us evidence today. Uh, we look forward to meeting you again in Aberdeen on Monday to discuss the expenditure side of the budget. I now close this session of the Finance Committee.